بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم معكم حمد الحميري مدير إدارة البحوث والخدمات المعرفية بالأرشيف الوطني بوزارة شؤون الرئاسة اسمحوا لي أن أحييكم جميعا من أبو ظبي في الإمارات العربية المتحدة ويسرني أن أرحب بالمتحدثين والمشاركين والمتابعين لهذا المؤتمر الأول للترجمة تحت شعار الترجمة في العصر الرقمي بين التقنيات الحديثة وتحديات النص التاريخي أولا دعوني أن أتقدم بالشكر الجزيل لجميع المشاركين في هذا المؤتمر الدولي الكبير الذين يمثلون جامعات الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية والجامعات الكندية وجامعات إيرلندا واسكتلندا البريطانية والجامعات الألمانية والأسبانية وجامعات سلوفينيا وجامعات أستراليا وكوريا الجنوبية وأذربيجان علاوة على ذلك وفود جامعة الإمارات وجامعة السربون والجامعات والمراكز البحثية المشاركة من المملكة العربية السعودية وعمان والكويت وجمهورية مصر العربية وبهذه المناسبة اسمحوا لي أن أتقدم بخالص الشكر الجزيل لإدارة الأرشيف الوطني على تنظيمها لهذا المؤتمر وعلى رأسها سعادة المدير العام والمدير التنفيذي للأرشيف الوطني وكذلك لا ننسى شريكنا الإعلامي أبو ظبي للإعلام والآن يشرفني أن أدعوكم وأدعو سعادة الدكتور عبد الله الريسي المدير العام للأرشيف الوطني لإلقاء كلمته الترحيبية لضيوف المؤتمر فليتفضل مشكورا Kindly now we are going to operate His Excellency Dr. Abdullah Raisi's speech in Arabic for those who are interested in listening to the English translation my kindly use the translation channel below السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته يسعدني أن أرحب بكم جميعا في مؤتمر الأرشيف الوطني الدولي الأول للترجمة تحت شعار الترجمة في العصر الرقمي بين التخانيات الحديثة وتحديات النص التاريخي يشارك في هذا المؤتمر الدولي ما يغو على أربعين باحثا ومتخصصا يمثلون كبرى الجامعات العالمية والمراكز البحثية والثقافية حيث يناقشون على مدى جلسات المؤتمر أهم التحديات التي تواجه حركة الترجمة في الوقت الراهن، حيث بدأت الترجمة تشكل الآن وأكثر من أي وقت مضى أحد أهم التبادلات الثقافية في عالمنا الحديث والمعاصر. لقد شرع الأرشيف الوطني في دولة الإمارات على تنظيم هذا المؤتمر بإيمان المطلق. لأن الترجمة قد أصبحت من أهم ديناميات التلاقح الثقافي ومن أبرز الآليات المحفزة للحوار مع الآخر ونشر ثقافة التسامح التي تنشدها دولة الإمارات العربية المتحدة انتقل الحضارات إلى الباحثين عن الاستقرار والأمن والأمان على مدار ثلاثة أيام من المناقشات المتواصلة يستطع المتحدثون في المؤتمر محاور متعددة مثل الترجمة الآلية والذكاء الصناعي وآليات العلماء وطرائق الترجمة في العصر الرقمي ومعضلات ترجمة الوثائق القديمة وسد الفتوات اللغوية في المحفوظات الأرشيفية 
من خلال الترجمة الرقمية وترجمة سرديات التاريخ الشفاهي والترجمة والهوية وحوار الحضارات وغيرها من المحاور الهامة. يتضمن برنامج المؤتمر عشر جلسات علمية مكثفة يشارك فيها أساتذة متخصصون من كبرى الجامعات في الولايات المتحدة وكندا والمملكة المتحدة وكوريا الجنوبية وغيرها من الجامعات الأوروبية والأسترالية والآسيوية العريقة على وعي المشاركين من الجامعات المحلية والإقليمية. في نهاية المؤتمر سوف تفضي المناقشات العلمية إلى نشر مجموعة متكاملة من البحوث التي تتناول بالتحديد أهم قضايا الترجمة المعاصرة ومشكلات الترجمة من وإلى اللغات المختلفة حول العالم. ختاما أتوجه بأسمى آيات الشكر إلى العاملين في الأرشيف الوطني القائمين على تنظيم المؤتمر. الذين بذلوا جهودا كبيرا طوال مرحلة الإعداد لهذا الحدث الأكاديمي متعدد الثقافات واللغات. وشكر موصول لجميع المشاركين والمتحدثين في هذا المؤتمر محليا وإقليميا ودوليا. خاصة كبار الأساتذة من الجامعات الأمريكية والكندية الذين استيقظوا مبكرا في هذا اليوم لمتابعة جلسات المؤتمر الذي تلوت من أبو ظبي عاصمة الإمارات التسامح والمحبة. أتمنى لكم مؤتمرا ناجحا ومناقشات علمية وأكاديمية جادة ومثمرة وحصادا بحثيا غزيرا في نهاية المؤتمر يحقق ما يصبو إليه المنظمون لهذا المؤتمر الدوري الكبير وتحقيق جميع الأهداف المطلوبة من الارتقاء بحركة الترجمة حول العالم وخدمة مجتمعنا وأمتنا والبشرية جمعا شكرا لكم مرة أخرى وأتمنى لكم مؤتمرا ناجحا يسرنا ندعو الدكتور صديق جوهر خبير الترجمة في الأرشيف الوطني للبدء بإلقاء كلمته الترحيبية إن أمكن Good morning everybody and welcome to the National Archives Translation Conference This is the, 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 this is the keynote speech of the conference under the title Translation and the Preservation of the Nation's Memory the National Archives Project Translations as a model. The famous translation historian and theorist Professor Peter Newmark argues that translation is an essential cornerstone of the cultural life of every civilized people. In fact, the translation is integral to every time and the place, and its transcultural output is widespread and profound. In terms of impact, translation is resembled to clouds. Nobody knows where it began and where it ends. In the Abu Dhabi National Archives and through translation, we take vigorous steps to promote cultural hybridity across different civilizations. Through translation, we promote mutual dialogues with the other. Through translation, we call for brotherhood and peace. Based on the teachings of all monotheistic religions. In the National Archives and on the initiative of the higher administration, we established the National Archives Translations Project whereby we translate relentlessly and frequently into various languages due to the importance of translation in the global cultural movement during the new millennium. In the National Archives Translation Division, we mainly translate history in order to preserve the memory of our nation. We give priority to historical translations because history is part of real life contexts and is capable of bringing about a change compared to fantasy books based on imagination and diverged from reality. Moreover, in the National Archives, we translate for the sake of possessing knowledge. We translate in order to deploy enlightening ideas and to confront thoughts of darkness we translate in order to preserve our long-standing legacies. We translate in order to spread multilingualism and the cultural diversity. 
We translate in order to introduce the world to our past and the present glories. We translate in order to enrich the human heritage locally, regionally, and internationally. We translate in order to inform the world of our history and the cultural achievements. We translate in order to disseminate the culture of tolerance. We translate in order to push our development process forward. We translate for more than a thousand reasons. We translate because we entered the era of translation hegemony. The era of translation hegemony and the circulation in a world overwhelmed with crowded ideas and similar multiple innovations a world in which chauvinism faded away and information becomes universal. In the current digital age, translation tasks have multiplied and the translator's job has undergone radical changes. In the digital era, the technological development in both automated media and the telecommunication sectors has contributed to maximizing the global tendency toward the translation. This tendency made the great Italian philosopher and the thinker Umberto Eco to consider translation as the reason for the cultural, linguistic, and civilizational enrichment of the old European continent and of the source of the renewal of its eminent historical legacy. The history of translation in Europe and America intersected with the history of the West as a whole, when different concepts of translation occurred in different periods of time. In the digital age, the international community has become more aware than ever before of the civilizational marathons rooted in translation. And from now on, we can say that whoever sows the wind reaps the storm, and whoever spreads the translation reaps tolerance and peace. The UAE historical and cultural heritage constitutes an intellectual stream flowing over time, incorporating an unparalleled national epic that captures in the high caliber style the tremendous developments the country has witnessed since the ancient eras, which shaped the existential pillars of the contemporary Emirati society. Translation in the National Archives aims to preserve the extended national and historical heritage that has its roots in the pre-state era emerging through the foundation stage after the founding fathers implemented the cornerstones of the state and stepping into the post-oil stage where the journey of progress and growth began and reaching an anchor in the current stage in which the UAE occupies a prominent position at the regional and global level. The world's attention has been focused on the Arab Gulf region since the time immemorial as a strategic crossing point between East and West. And this interest gradually escalated until it reached its climax recently in the wake of the geopolitical challenges confronting the countries of the regional neighborhood. In addition to exploring and documenting the history and the ancient Emirati past, the National Archives translation projects aim to pay tribute to the current and modern Emirati civilizational endeavors and accomplishments that exceeded expectations by transferring them to many foreign languages. In the National Archives, we translate all literature written about the UAE and its surroundings in order to chronicle a history enriched, a history entrenched in transformations, uncertainties, 
and the tidal waves of civilization and the heritage that formed a culture which, since a time immemorial, opened its arms to the world, transcended the borders of the sea, desert, and mountains, and exceeded the horizons until it reached recently to the higher planets and the spheres of heaven. In the National Archives, we translate ancient history and contemporary history because the UAE has become a safe oasis and a sanctuary of people from all over the world who search for work, stability, investment, education, tourism, entertainment, and recovery, etc. Thanks to the wise policies of the state leaders, the UAE has turned into a cultural beacon for the dissemination of science, knowledge, and literatures, and an important center for stimulating global trade exchanges. The whole world also witnessed the magnificence of the innumerable and unprecedented civilizational achievements contributed by the UAE in various fields throughout the UAE procession of progress. In the National Archives, we translate history because every great nation has its own history, heritage, and writers. Because every great nation has its own history, heritage, and writers who immortalize its glories, like Stephen Malarme, who praised the glories of France, and Whitman, who glorified America. In the National Archives, we translate history because the UAE has its own historians who chronicled its history and internalized its glories, its heritage, its folklore in the past and at present. Through these writings, the UAE historians made the world hear the tangles of its winds, the songs of its desert and sea, the chants of its balm trees, and the dews spring falling down on the eyelids of Hafid Mountain, who never sleeps. In the National Archives, we translate our contemporary history to document the prominent civilizational and humanitarian role played by the UAE at present, as the UAE is taken as a model to be emulated in economic, intellectual, and educational progress, peaceful coexistence, tolerance, human communication, cross-civilizational hybridity, and intercultural dialogues. In the current historical juncture, the role of the National Archives emerged with its various cultural initiatives for mostly the translations project which aims to make a paradigmatic shift in the translation domain by exchanging information and knowledge with partners, cultural makers, major authors, historians, and the most important publishing houses in the world where translation plays a significant role in civil society in various aspects of political, social, and economic life. Currently, the National Archives translations contribute to the dissemination of linguistic and the cultural diversity at the regional and the international levels. In the National Archives, we translate because translation has become the essence of contemporary human civilization. Furthermore, translation is unequivocally considered in many regions of the world as an essential gateway to scientific, economic, and the technical progress and development. There is no doubt that translation constitutes the vital nerve capable of effecting essential communication between peoples in hostilities and bridging the gaps between conflicting nations. The Arabs in the early Abbasid era were aware that they achieved enormous advancements in the spiritual arena, but their knowledge about the spiritual fields 
was not sufficient to convince the other of what the abus is. Thus, they turned to translating the Greek and the Roman history books and the philosophical theories of Plato and Aristotle. Through the translation of Greek philosophy, the Arabs were able to initiate an early civilizational dialogue with the other. Translating Greek philosophy made the Arabs overcome many of the existential problems inherent in their thinking, while translating the books of medicine and pharmacy solved many problems for them in their daily life. Historically, the Arabs were not satisfied with sitting what the others have, but adding to what was translated, what was being translated to them extra ordinary contributions, confirming that they were not a burden on the life of others, but rather part of life's movement and continuity, which made them worthy of it and made the others in dire need of their production and knowledge. The others translated the books of Jabir ibn Hayyan, ibn Sima, ibn Rajd, Averos, and Al-Farabi, and Ahmad bin Majid's studies on maritime navigation. We translate books, but we expect from the translated books to speak to humans rather than to provide partial specialized knowledge because the Arab reader wants to communicate with the others. And at the same time, he doesn't want more confusion and, and the complexity in this communication. Here lies the truth. The value of translation is not contingent upon the propaganda and the media boasting of publishing houses or other parties concerned with translation of the huge numbers of books they translate or publish. But the issue is based on the extent to which the Arab mind needs what is translated. Flooding our markets with translated books and overcrowding our periodicals with translated articles will bear fruit in a negative way unless we realize the importance of selecting what we translate from the culture of the others. Translation into Arabic is not the only path to intercultural dialogue. This kind of translation is presented to the self on behalf of the other and do not to the other on behalf of the self. No doubt, this kind of translation strengthens within us the need to integrate with the Western other, to meet our needs while turning a blind eye to a long history of Western offenses to the East. But we need to make a gigantic breakthrough inside the culture of the Western other. And this will be achieved by creating a kind of balance between what is translated into Arabic and what is translated from Arabic into other languages, especially English. The unilateral strengthening of dialogue will remain ineffective at all paradigms since the level of comparison between the translations that reach us and the translations that reach the other is still very scanty. Therefore, we must convey through translation the bright aspects of our heritage in order to enhance the civilizational dialogue with the other on comparable paces. The current absence of coordination among Arab translators due to the absence of a bibliographic base handled by an official party via the internet will lead to the loss and the dispersion of efforts. Currently, there are multiple translations of the same books and a mess of terminology which will generate problems whose solutions are complicated and far-fetched. The strategy of establishing a dialogue with the West based on translation cannot be very effective unless it is combined with other factors, including setting up 
bibliographic database of valuable literature in Arabic language, or what has been translated from Arabic into other languages. This should be done so that the Arab reader feels that in his dialogue with the other, he, she stands on solid ground. The Arab reader needs to feel that he, she leans on a great legacy of heritage and traditions, which deserves glorification and the honor. The Arab reader needs to take pride in his history and civilization and to promote them in the cultural territories of the other. On this level and in support of the translation movement at the local, regional, and international levels, and upon the initiative of the National Archives Higher Administration, this international conference was organized with the support and the participation of a galaxy of the high caliber translation specialists and a number of senior researchers from several prestigious universities around the world. This flagship conference hosted by the National Archives is considered a pioneering research platform in various fields of translation and constitutes a significant avenue for presenting the latest studies and the research in various fields of translation. The conference is divided into several specialized sessions that discuss a number of themes and the related topics inherent in several translation issues and data and, and debates through a group of academic studies and research papers. Finally, we thank all the National Archives staff in the units, departments, and sections that participated in this conference, especially the translation and the publishing division. We also thank our Abu Dhabi media partner and the researchers, translators, and distinguished professors contributing to the conference sessions from inside and outside the UAE. We would like to thank all the delegations participating in the conference from the universities of Harvard, Binghamton, and California at Los Angeles in the United States of America, and delegations from the universities of Wilfrid Laurier and Ottawa from Canada. And would like to thank delegations from the universities of Queens and Edinburgh from the United Kingdom. And would like to thank delegations from Ljubljana University in Slovenia and delegations from Hancock University in South Korea. And would like to thank delegations from Marburg University in Germany and Alcanti University in Spain and delegations from Sydney Australia. Our thanks are extended to all participating delegations from the universities of Ain Shams and the Cairo in Egypt, and from Baku University, Azerbaijan, and from the universities of Sorbonne and UAE, and the Abu Dhabi Louvre Museum, UAE. Our thanks are extended to the delegations from Taiba University, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and from Bremen University, Oman, and from Gulf University for Science and the Technology, and the Higher Institute of Theater, and the Kuwaiti Translation Society from Kuwait. We also express our thanks to the editor-in-chief of Turas Magazine, Abu Dhabi, and the director of the Tanta International Poetry Festival for their valuable participation. Finally, I wish all of you a successful conference and a happy times, punctuated by serious academic discussions with my best wishes to all of you. Thanks for your kind attention and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, Sadiq, uh, Doctor, for your uh, keynote. Uh, uh, and I would like to also uh, uh, welcoming again all our participants. I thank Dr. Sadiq Johar for the introduction and the word of the introduction to this introduction. Now, let me ask you to introduce the film for the 
ومن بعدها سوف نقوم بأخذ استراحة إلى الساعة الواحدة والنصف بتوقيت الإمارات وذلك ليتناسب مع زملائنا المشاركين في الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية وكندا Now let me share with you the short documentary movie and then after that we are moving to a break until 1.30 Abu Dhabi time to be suitable for our participants in the United States and Canada and the other universities. So uh, be there, uh, stay with us, and um, uh, wish you uh, uh, a pleasant uh, uh, watching this movie. Can we start the movie? And see you in 1.30 Abu Dhabi time. <laughs> victories and determination of its people. Therefore, it was necessary for this history to be written with utmost honesty. The UAE's National Archives was established in 1968 under the name of Documents and Research Bureau. Following the directives of the late Sheikh Zayed bin Sultan Al Nahyan, and was affiliated with the ruler's court, Al Diwan Al Amiri. In its early times, it undertook the task of collecting documents and information on the history and culture of the Arabian Peninsula in general and the UAE in particular from their original sources in Arab and foreign countries, in addition to documenting and translating the same. After the formation of the Union, it entered a new phase of contribution and activities, changing its name to the Center for Documentation and Studies in 1972, and then Federal Law No. 7 of 2008 established the National Center for Documentation and Research, following which Federal Law No. 1 of 2014 changed its name to the National Archives. Over 50 years of hard work and conducting research into the folds and mysteries of history on all issues relating to the UAE, the National Archives has been able to occupy a remarkable position among similar Middle East and global institutions. Now its studies are considered references for research on the history of the Arabian Gulf and the UAE. The National Archives became a new milestone in the UAE and a cultural landmark in the Arabian Gulf as being the oldest cultural institution in the UAE and the largest documentation center in the Gulf region. The National Archives has not confined its work to preserving only the history of the UAE and the past achievements of its men, but has worked hard to deliver honest history to future generations. The National Archives held and participated in regional and international seminars and conferences and organized UAE-related exhibitions in the UAE and abroad. It has issued many books and publications that have become the first reliable source for Arab intellectuals and researchers. 
the National Archives have added a page to the history of the UAE, which it preserves and safeguards. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, dear respectable speakers and conference followers. Welcome to the National Archives First Translation Conference. I am Aisha Dahri, head of the translation and publication section at the National Archives. I'm speaking from Abu Dhabi and I will chair this session titled Translation and Trans Civilizational Dialogue in the New Millennium. Today we have four distinguished speakers who will present their papers in this session. Each one will be given a time between 15 to 20 minutes at maximum after the end of all presentations. Five to 10 minutes will be given for short questions and short answers as well. Dear conference followers, to hear the interpretation in Arabic, kindly click on the global icon below and choose Chinese language. أسعد المتابعين للاستماع إلى الترجمة الفورية باللغة العربية يرجى الضغط على علامة الكل الأرضية واختيار اللغة الصينية. We will start the session with Professor Neil Sadler from Queen's University, Belfast, UK. Professor Sadler's general area of specialization is translation and interpreting. He holds a PhD from the Center for Translation and Intercultural Studies at the University of Manchester. And his research centers on, centers on narrative and interpretation in digital, digitally mediated contexts. In this session, his presentation is about translation and datafication, 
Dear Professor Sadler, the microphone is yours. Thank you very much. Um, is there a few telegrams that are not there? Yes, Doctor. Okay, so I think it's possible to speak Arabic because the people who are here are not aware of it, so I think it's possible to be better than that. It's uh, up to you, Doctor. Okay, at your convenience. For the last one, I'm going to share the screen. Okay, so I'm going to share the screen. تمام اللي ابدا ف اود ان اشكر منظمه المحاضره الاول يعني على الدعوه والمشاركه وعايز اقول كمان في البدايه انه البحث ده في مرحله الاولى وانه استكشافي يعني فانا عايز اطرح الاسئله قبل يعني بدل ما اوفر اجابات نهائيه وواضحة لكل المشاكل اللي نتكلم عنها. وكمان لازم أقول إنه دي تقديمي الأول باللغة العربية فبس أطلب منكم أن تغفروا أخطائي اللغوية. فموضوع تقديمي اليوم هي الترجمة والتحويل البيانات. فأنا أعتقد إن هذا موضوع مهم جدا بس موضوع ما شفناش يعني ما درسناهاش يعني كثير في دراسة الترجمة لحد دلوقتي بس أعتقد إن إن الظاهر دي مهمة جدا بالنسبة لنا والمفروض إننا يعني ندرسها بشكل عميق وإنه هيكون موضوع مهم جدا للفترة اللي جاية كمان. نظرا للتغيرات التكنولوجية اللي بتحصل اليوم دول. فلنبدا مع تعريف الديتيفيكيشن او ما يسمى باللغه العربيه التحويل البيانات فحسب علماء الديتيفيكيشن في ثلاث عناصر يعني مهمه فالاول انه بس كميه البيانات اللي موجوده ولما اقول بيانات قصدي البيانات الرقميه ايوه رقميه يعني بس اكثر بالمقارنه مع الماضي يعني بس بكل بساطه في بيانات عن كل شيء اكثر مما كانت موجوده يعني من 10 سنين او من 20 سنين وطبعا من 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 50 سنه ممكن فوق كذا يعني ما ما بس انه في كم يعني بيانات اكثر ولكن في رغبه قويه جدا الايام دول لفهم العالم عن طريق البيانات دي ففي بيانات وكم بس كمان بنحاول نستخدم هذه البيانات لنفهم يعني حاجه في الحياه اللي ما كناش نفكر فيها عن طريق البيانات قبل كده او على الاقل مش لنفس الدرجه ونفس الحد مثلا كثير ما نتكلم نفكر في التعليم او الرعايه الصحيه على ايام دول عن طريق البيانات والعنصر الثالث اللي ممكن يكون الاهم وهنا انا اخذت شويه من ميخاس وكولجي وهم بيقولوا انه ديتيفيكيشن هو تحويل واسع للحياه البشريه علشان عناصرها تكون مصادر مستمره للبيانات فالفكره انه ليه في كل البيانات دي؟ علشان احنا غيرنا حياتنا اسلوب حياتنا علشان نوفر البيانات بشكل مستمر وانا اعتقد كمان انه ده او الفكره دي لها تداعيات مهمه اللي ترجموا وهنرجع اليها بعدين. لازم نعترف كمان انه يعني رغبه في فهم العالم عن طريق البيانات مش جديد على الاطلاق يعني فممكن في وقت الاستعمار الانجليزي في القرن 19 كانت فكره مهمه جدا انا اخذت الصوره دي من حرب فيتنام في امريكا لما وزير الدفاع ماكنامارا في امريكا حاول يخلي الحرب هناك حرب علميه واصله كان يستخدم البيانات الرقميه علشان يعرف يعني المفروض يقود الحرب او يشن الحرب ازاي اوكي فكان تقريبا نفس نفس طريقه التفكير ولكن الاختلاف انه دلوقتي في الوقت الحالي شفنا انه حصل يعني انه الفكره بقت ان اكثر انتشارا وشاعرة وتأثيرا بشكل كبير جدا 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 وانتشر لمجالات أخرى. كمان عايز أؤكد إنه في علاقة يعني عميقة مع أو بين تحويل البيانات ورقمنا ولكنهما كمان شيئين مختلفين لازم نأكد كذا. فلنوضح هذا ممكن نشوف الخرائط اللي كانت موجودة في التسعينات اللي كانت تستخدم البيانات ولكن 
كشيء بس كان الشيء يعني اشياء ثابته ولكن لما نشوف الخرائط اللي موجوده الايام دول زي جوجل مثلا في دايره بيانيه اذا ممكن نتكلم عنها هنايا زي الداتا سيركل فالخريطه بتوفر خدمه عن طريق استخدام البيانات ولكن الخريطه كمان بتستخرج بيانات من مستخدمي التطبيق زي كذا فبياخذ البيانات لتحسين التطبيق وكمان لاغراض مختلفه يعني اللي في تطبيق مختلفه بتاعت جوجل فنشوف ان الدائره دي يكون في في الاساس ده الشيء الاساسي وده الاختلاف فرقم الشيء ضروريه لازم تكون موجوده علشان يكون في تحويل للبيانات ولكن مش كافيه لوحدها لازم يكون في شيء ثاني اضافي كمان لازم نتاكد انه في جانب راسمالي قوي جدا 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 فيما يخص تحويل البيانات فشفنا التغيير ده متعلق بشكل عميق مع تصرفات الشركات الكبيره وبشكل خاص الشركات الامريكيه في كاليفورنيا يعني شركات البيانيه يعني الداتا كومبانيز فما بس بيستخرجوا البيانات ولكن يستخدموا البيانات لاغراض راسماليه لكسب الارباح لكسب المال يعني باشكال مختلفه وهذا مهم كمان فيما يخص الترجمه فلما نفكر في دور البيانات والتحويل للبيانات في الترجمه نشوف ان كل العناصر دي موجوده يعني وبشكل قوي فلنبدا مع القول انه بكل بساطه في بيانات اكثر كثير فيما يخص الترجمه من اللي كانت موجوده من من كام سنه حتى فمثلا في التسعينات كان في مشروع في جامعه مانشستر في انجلترا The Corpus of Translated English او متن اللغه الانجليزيه المترجمه اوكي okay, علشان يشوفوا الاختلافات ما بين اللغه المترجمه واللغه غير المترجمه. هم على مدار سنين ممكن خمس سنين ومع جهد وتعب كبير جدا 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 جمعوا 10 ملايين كلمه علشان يحطوه في المتن. من شهر تقريبا انا شفت مقاله على الموقع الموقع الالكتروني لشركه ترجمه اللي عملوا بحث بسيط يعني سريع بس علشان يعني يشوفوا يعني الـ 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 الامتيازات او الجوانب الاحسن للخدمه اللي الشركه توفرها وهم جمعوا 500 مليون كلمه زي كذا في خمس دقائق فده الفرق انه البيانات الرقميه موجوده دلوقتي بشكل كبير جدا 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 كمان جمع واستخدام البيانات بقى شيء اساسي في الشغل اليومي للمترجمين يعني تقريبا كل المترجمين المحترفين ودلوقتي يتكلم عن الترجمه يعني التجاريه ما اتكلمش عن ترجمه الادب ولكن عن في السياق القانون او الصحه والتجاره بشكل عام تقريبا كلهم يستخدموا ادوات الترجمه بالاستعانه بالحاسوب او الكات تولز الادوات دي تقريبا وسيله لجمع واستخدام البيانات علشان نترجم بس بعدين نحط اللي نترجمه في ذاكره الكترونيه علشان نستخرج فائده منها بعدين. ده استخدام وجمع البيانات. كمان ده مرتبط به ومتعلق به بس مش ممكن نختزله في رقمنه انه كان لازم يكون في رقم علشان يكون في الادوات دي ولكن الدائره البيانيه اللي نشوف فيها اللي تقريبا زي الدائره اللي شفنا مع جوجل ده شيء مختلفة مش نتيجة ضرورية ولكن اختيارية يعني بعض الشركات شافت انه كان في فرصة وانتهزوا يعني هذه الفرصة كمان هذا متعلق بالاقتصاد والتجارة الحديثة فنشوف ان كثير من الشركات او شركات الترجمة الايام دول بقت تقريبا شركات بيانية يعني بيستخدموا البيانات فممكن يستخرجوا ارباح زياده باستخدام البيانات اوكي فليه عايزين يجمعوا البيانات علشان تحسين تحسين الخدمه اوكي لحد ما بس اكثر من كذا علشان يكسبوا فلوس اكثر اوكي ففيما بعد آه اني هركز مش على وصف التغيير نفسها علشان اعتقد انها معروفه يعني لحد ما كلنا شفنا تغيير دي الى حد كبير خلال السنين اللي فاتت 
بس عايز اركز على تداعياتها لكيان او وجود المترجم او هو الترجمه بشكل عام ما تاثيرات تغير كده اذا نفكر في المترجمين كاشخاص كبشر فانا اشوف انه وجهه نظري فلسفيه شويه بس ان شاء الله تكون مفيده وواضحه ف علشان افكر في الموضوع ده اني اخذ افكار كثير من مارتن هايدجر وبشكل خاص من كتابه بين اند تايم فالكتاب ده معقد جدا 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 فيها <تصفيق> افكار كثيره قوي بس ممكن الفكره الاكثر اهميه في السياق كذا هو انه مارتن هايدجر انتقد الفكره انه الشخص مستقل انه كيان الشخص ان الشخص يكون موجود وبعدين يتعامل مع مع العالم. وقال لا انه العالم وتعاملاتنا مع العالم والادوات اللي نستخدمها والتكنولوجيا والافكار والاشخاص الثانيين شيء اساسي اساسي في كياننا وما ينفعش ان نفكر في كيان او وجود اي شخص بدون كل العلاقات دي. بحيث انه العالم يعني ممكن حتى قبل الشخص في التاثير مش من الشخص للعالم نسالي ولكن من العالم الى الشخص اوكي فما ينفعش نفكر في اي شخص بدون كل اللي حواليه وال... وال... ايوه تمام فلما نطبق هذه الفكره لل... للترجمه بشكل خاص في وقت التحويل الى بيانات يبدو كاننا مش من المم... يبدو كانه مش من الممكن اننا نشوف التكنولوجيا او البيانات كشيء او كشيئين اضافيين للمترجم لازم نشوف انها يعني اشياء اساسيه يعني علشان نفهم المترجم اللي شخص معين يكونه لازم نشوف البيانات اللي يستخدمه والتكنولوجيا اللي يستخدمه وكلها مع بعض اللي يشكل المترجم اوكي وهو مش ممكن يكون نفس المترجم لو ما كانش عنده البيانات دي والتكنولوجيا دي وكذا اوكي فالتأثير عميق في 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 ابسط مستوى. هذا مهم ليه؟ مهم علشان حسب هايدجر الكيان بشكل عام بيوفر الخلفيه التأويليه او التفسيريه يعني الانتربرتيف باك جراوند. فكل شيء اللي ممكن نشوفه او نفهمه في العالم بيحصل عن طريق الكيان ده. فمثلا نشوف انه البيانات اللي عندنا كمترجمين يؤثر على تفسيرنا لاشياء مختلفه. مثلا لو مهما ترجمة تبدو سهلة ولا صعبة مثلا أنا عندي معرفة لغوية ممتازة في سياق القانون بس ما عنديش بيانات كثير في ذاكرتي فأنا أقول أوكي لغويا المهمة دي مش صعبة ولكن ما عنديش البيانات اللي هتساعدني فأنا شايف أن المهمة دي صعبة أوكي زي كذا كمان المهم المهام اللي لها قيمة أو ما لهاش قيمة ممكن أقول أنه أنا ما عنديش خبرة في في سياق القانون فعلشان أترجم نص قانوني هياخد تعب كبير مني هياخد وقت كثير بس أنا حكسي بخبرة أوكي تمام بس أكثر من كذا عن إنني حنتج بيانات في ذاكرتي اللي ممكن أستخرج فائدة منها بعدين فيما بعد في خلينا نشوف أو نفكر في في الصعوبة في الـ في الـ في, الـ في المهام المرغوب فيها ومش المرغوب فيها بشكل مختلف. كمان يسمح لنا بأننا نشوف حتى ذاكرة المترجم بشكل مختلف. تكلمنا شوية عن يعني دور ذاكرة الترجمة في شغل المترجمين اللي يعملون بس كمان لما نحاول الذاكرة إلى شيء بيانية لعدة بيانات ممكن نبيعها ممكن نشتريها فبقى في أسواق بيانية زي كذا للغردة بالضبط علشان أنا أقول أوكي أنا ترجمت كذا من العربي الإنجليزي بعدين ممكن أس... يعني أخرج الذاكرة دي من مخي حطه إلى بيانات زي كذا علشان أبعدها لمترجم ثاني علشان هو يستفيد منها. والشيء الاخير اللي, اللي عايز اقوله انه هايدجر تكلم بشكل كبير عن التكنولوجيا وهو شاف التكنولوجيا بشكل مختلف عن جميع معظم الناس. هو شاف انه التكنولوجيا طريقه تفكير يعني بدل ما يكون تكنولوجيا معينه 
لا التكنولوجيا يعني طريقه التفكير اللي بدانا نستخدمها من قرن تقريبا وهو شاف انه قبل ظهور التكنولوجيا بالمعنى الحديث كنا نشوف العالم ك... ك... يعني بس كما هو فمثلا لو شفنا غابه شفنا إن... انها غابه اوكي او شخص بس شخص بس مع التكنولوجيا انه يقول ان ب... بدانا نشوف العالم ك اللي هو سما باللغه الالمانيه بشتاند او مخزون او ستاندينغ ريزيرف صاعد باللغه الانجليزيه فبدل ما نشوف غابه كغابه مليان صغر بنشوفها انستد بس كمصدر للموارد اللي ممكن نستخدمها لاغراض مختلفه فبس موارد يعني اللي ممكن نستخدمها اوكي حتى ما نعرف يعني لما نقطع شجره مش عارفين بالضبط هنستخدمها ازاي ولا حتى ما انا اعتقد انه تحويل للبيانات يتسبب في نفس التغيير عند الترجمه وطريقه تفكيرنا في المترجمين زمان كان شغل المترجم زي شغل حرفي كان ان الشركه تبعت نص للمترجم المترجم يترجم النص ويبعثه للشركه وخلاص انتهى الامر ما كانش في فائده اضافيه ممكن الشركه تستخرجها من ترجمه النص كده ده بقى مختلف الايام دول علشان يعني لسه لازم الشركه تبعت النص علشان المترجم يترجم النص وبعدين يبعته لل... للمستخدم الخير ولكن ممكن كمان ان الشركه تستخرج بيانات اللي ممكن الشركه تستخدمها في المستقبل لاغراض مختلفه ففي زي كسب اضافي وده الى حد ما نعتقد ان ده يحاول المترجم زي بشتاند ممكن نفكر في المترجمين كشيء زي الغابه في مثل هايدجر كانهم مخزون للفائده ممكن استخراجها يعني عن يعني ممكن الشركات تستخرج الفائده دي من المترجمين. اكسكيوز مي بروفيسور نيل يو ستيل هاف 3 مينتس تو جيت دون ثانك يو. يا ذاتس اوكي انا هقف هنا فيعني <تصفيق> حسب الساعه عندي ده 15 دقيقه فاشكر الجميع على الاستماع. I would like to thank Professor Sadler for his insightful research and commitment to presentation time. Now let me invite our second speaker, Professor Carl Steintes from the University of Harvard, USA, to present his paper titled Translation for Global Cooperation. Professor Carr is the Alexander and Victoria Willey Professor of Landscape Architecture and the Plan Planning Emeritus at Harvard Graduate School of Design and Honorary Professor at the Center for Advanced Spatial Analysis, University College London. Professor Carl has been honored as one of Harvard University's outstanding teachers. He is a principal author of Alternative Futures for Changing Landscapes and author of a framework for geodesign. Dear Professor Kahl, kindly start your presentation. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me. I'm not a translator. I'm an author and teacher whose work is being used in most of the countries of the world. And I face, with my colleagues, enormous problems of translation. But the problem that we're interested in is how will the world react to climate change and demographic change in the next one or two generations. And we, we call our work geodesign, which is itself an invented word. What it means is that we end up having to change geography by design, by intentional change. In 2018, I and two colleagues decided that we would need to coordinate a global approach, each party of which operates potentially in a different language, to how to coordinate the many local and regional studies that eventually have to cooperatively collaborate at the global level, and to do this actually very rapidly. We started in January 2018, and by word of mouth, 
We now have 220 multidisciplinary teams in universities around the world in now 60 countries. And in the last two and a half, three years, we've completed 130 local, regional, and in some cases, national studies of how reaction to global climatic and demographic change might occur. The scope of the problem is enormous. This is a map of global land use change between 1960 and 2020. I began my teaching at MIT in America in 1960 as a graduate student. And this is a forecast from the uh, National Academy of Sciences of the United States of human climate niche suitability. In other words, the red areas will have a major decline in water supply and agricultural productivity. The green areas will improve between now and the year 2070. And if this is true, and it comes out to be true, and I believe it's likely to be true, that about a billion and a half people will have to seriously consider moving from the red areas to the green areas. And this is an enormous design problem caused globally, but resolved locally. This relationship between global issues and local issues inevitably requires collaboration, negotiation, and translation. On the left side, the sciences, which study the existing conditions, the past conditions, and possibly future projected conditions, speak different languages among themselves. On the right-hand side, the local people, ordinary people, and their governments don't necessarily on, agree on what should happen. And they speak different languages across borders, inside countries, inside cities. The sciences do very well at the global level, but do very poorly at the local level. The local level does very well at the local level and does very poorly at the global level. This middle ground, which is where I've worked for more than 50 years, is where the major infrastructure and political decisions get made that affect both the global side and the local side. And here is where the sciences and the design professions and the people of the place and the information technologies have to collaborate and negotiate. And the language issue is crucial. Collaboration requires a framework for collaboration. How are we going to do it? And a basis for communication. This is the work of Norbert Wiener in his book, Cybernetics from 1948. Communication requires three things, a shared knowledge of the subject, shared assumptions, and a shared language. And Wiener's work influenced Marshall McLuhan in his book, The Extensions of Man, 1964, where you have the people having to send a message to the scientists, the planners, the information people who have to talk among themselves, work among themselves, and send a message back from their professional languages through media back to the people who make the decisions. This is, this is a translation, not in time, but among people whose real languages of their work and their understanding are different. I've written a book based on this process of collaboration among different people with different ideas, different languages. It's called A Framework for Geodesign. It's been translated into many languages. 
I'll focus on two of them, Arabic and Chinese, both languages which I have no knowledge of. The book basically involves questions. What are the questions that you have to ask? How should this area be described? How does it work? Is it working well? How might it be changed? What differences might the changes cause? How should it be changed? And each of these questions has a set of models, a set of abstractions from the real world. And they get organized into three types. The why questions, why are we doing this work? The how questions, how should we do this work? And the what, where, and when questions. How should we change this place? And this is, this is the work that I've done for a long time with my students and my colleagues. The second component, it has an actual workflow. These models represent things that need to be done during the course of making a study of how Abu Dhabi should change between now and 2050, for example. Things need to be done by people, and the people need to understand each other. And that's not the, that's a very difficult thing. And finally, the realization, the realization that in a collaborative enterprise, ideas can come from anybody. Ideas can come from anybody, but ideas have to be understood by everybody. That's the hard part. Professor Naima al Hassani from uh, UAEU is, is a colleague uh, who translated uh, my book into Arabic. It, I, let me tell a story about the translation into Arabic. She took on the job voluntarily because she's interested as the head of the sustainability department at the university. She knows the work that, that I've done in the past. I've, I've taught at the UAE University. And she said, I'm gonna translate your book. I have no idea how she's doing it, but I asked her in an email, what were the main issues that you have had? And she responded, most of the challenges I confronted in the translation of the book are associated not with the translation of individual words, but with phrases and linguistic clusters due to a lack of Arabic equivalences of these sophisticated language combinations and structures. By the way, I'm proud of the fact that I generally don't talk in jargon. I talk in simple language. But even there, there are problems. They seem simple and accessible in English. But differences between English and Arabic language systems make it difficult to render these language combinations into Arabic texts understandable by the average reader, the reader. Therefore, I had to search for new structures to be used in Arabic for the first time. These borrowed structures enrich the Arabic language, at least I hope so. Naima al Hassani. And below are some of the combinations that are relatively simple in English, but caused her difficulty in Arabic. I don't know how to pronounce Arabic, so I'm, I assume many of you do. Framing G design means how do you organize it? The anticipatory change model, when you're thinking ahead. The constraining change model, when you're being told you can't do anything, do something. A mixed model, sequential, one after the other, and agent-based. Agent-based models are technical terms where each decision is actually, actually assumed to be a person or an idea moving through a space. And the roles of history and precedent. History is, is, and precedent are not exactly the same. But we have other problems. Take a diagram like this. And I'm not going to go through the, the technical aspects of it, but this is a diagram in English, which reads from the upper left down to the lower right and back. It's a circular diagram with feedback loops. What happens in Arabic when the normal reader 
expects to begin in the upper right-hand corner. This would be a very easy diagram to translate. Take the graphics and replace the words. I've left the English words here because I didn't have time to deal with Naima uh, al Hassani and, and do this. But imagine that this is a diagram in Arabic. It would be very easy to read from the upper left. But what about this? This is the identical scoring of a plan in the United Nations Sustainability Development Goals. The numbers are identical. The characteristics are identical. But one is from the upper left in English, and one is from the upper right in any other language that starts in the upper right, Hebrew, Arabic, others. If this was an international conference and we had to put these side by side, we would say, hey, these are very different. But in fact, they're identical. One is just reversed. So reversing tables, reversing numbers, reversing graphs, reversing diagrams, that's actually very difficult. Here's another example. This is the core diagram of the book. In English on the upper left, in Arabic flipped with its language correctly from the upper right. But in the upper right-hand corner of this graph is Chinese in which the diagram goes up and down, but the language goes from right to left. And in the lower right is Hebrew where the translator decided to not change the diagram but to leave the Hebrew, which goes from right to left in a diagram that's read from right from left to right. That's got to be very confusing. Now, what happens if we operate globally? And we do. We have, we have several Arabic speaking ones. We have Hebrew, we have Chinese, we have Japanese, we have English. We have all kinds of languages in here. We decided when we made the collaboration to emphasize graphics rather than language. In other words, let's do this in a way that minimizes the need to speak any language. And if we do speak languages, let's speak English and translate into every language, either digitally or through translation. So what we did was we adopted graphic codes, color codes, symbols. Every land use is in a standard color. Every map in the world, which now is not in standard colors, should be in standard colors. They should all be in standard scales. They should all have the same scenario basis. They should all follow the UN development goals and in their symbols. All analytic maps should be in the same colors. Red means it's bad. Yellow means it's inappropriate. The more green it is, the better it is. Why? Because globally traffic lights already are in a global code. Why not use the same global code for the analysis of where things should be? The sciences have used diagrams for hundreds of years. Diagrams express location, size, relationship. Much easier than words. The design professions have used diagrams for hundreds of years for location, for size for relationship. And so we're using diagrams as a universal language. We have software based on my book, and there are many other pieces of software, which work with diagrams and graphics, not necessarily with words. 
The software is machine translatable into any of the major languages, about 30 of them. It's not perfect translation, but it's good enough to work. So for example, when I taught at the University of the United Arab Emirates in Naeem al Hosani's class, we decided to do a study of the growth of Al Ain between 2020 and 2050. And her students in two days learned software, made about 150 diagrams of policies and projects, recognizing the plan for our lane for 2030, but thinking till the year 2050, and said to themselves, what would happen if Alain doubled in its urban size? It has to grow outside the municipality. What will happen? And what will happen under different scenarios of innovation? And how is that influencing the United Nations sustainability goals? And they did this all in two days, working about 10 hours a day. They presented it in English at the International Congress, where their study could be directly compared with the London Growth Study and the Sao Paulo Study and 50 others because they're in exactly the same graphic language. And when we published the first 50 studies, it was very, very clear that no set of global policies or projects will be workable and that regional and local variations will dominate decision-making, but systematically. As a result, we're now teaching faculty members, I am, teaching faculty members globally how to do this work in English. But when they meet their students, many of whom speak English, most of whom are bilingual at least, the aim is to have translatable guidance in terms of YouTube videos, books, diagrams, and case studies. And frankly, that's the only way that the globe will come together in the next 20 to 30 years to solve these problems. And frankly, we need 100,000 people who are educated to work across professions, across sciences, and collaboratively not as specialists, but as educated generalists. And translation is the key to this process. Thank you very much. Dear all, let me express my thanks for Professor Steintis for his illuminating presentation. Thank you, Professor. Let me now invite our third speaker, Dr. Leslie Tramantini for, from the University of Philips Marburg, Germany, to present her paper titled, Poetry is what gets lost in translation on the pitfalls and challenges faced when translating Arabic poetry. Dr. Tramantini teaches modern Arabic literature at the University of Freiburg, Germany. She is the executive director coordinator of the Center for Near and Middle Eastern Studies. Philips University Marburg. She is also an official translator and interpreter, Arabic, German, and vice versa. Dear Dr. Leslie, the microphone is yours. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Um, thank you, Aisha, for in. Uh, for this nice introduction. Thank you for inviting me to this conference. I'm afraid we will change now totally the subject because 
what uh, Dr. Neil and Dr. Karl have just said is something totally different from what I'm going to say. I am going to talk about um, translating Arabic poetry and the challenges and difficulties I find uh, within it. So I will start. What is translation? In English and the Romanic language, the word translation derives from Latin. Some minor differences. English translate means to carry something across from one side to the other. Uh, French and Italian traduire and tradure comes from leading something across from one side to the other. In German, übersetzen means also moving something from one side to the other. So always two sides must be reached. The origin of the Arabic tarjama is disputed. Most probably it is a Semitic quadrilateral root which in Aramaic and Hebrew meant in classical Arabic, Tarjama meant a biographical notice of a person or dividing a book into several chapters. So, explanation and clarification leads us into modern Arabic, where Tarjama came to meet translation. So, to translate, I think, to sum up means to carry something to the other side and include the notion of explaining. But what are the two different sides which must be reached? The most obvious one is from one culture to another, from one language to another. There is also a translation taking place between two different periods of time and history. So explaining poetry of the early Middle Ages from Alfuchdeutsch to German speakers 800 years later is the process of translating too. And in the Arabic context, the Mu'anaqat include a lot of explanations of the words, the gharaib, the locations, the social conventions which were added partly centuries later and without which modern uh, Arab readers would be lost, also modern Arab native speakers. These explanations are a kind of translation too. So translating includes the notions of transporting something from A to B in both a temporal and a spatial sense, while at the same time explaining it and giving it a new sense. So, a translation should be literal where possible and paraphrastic where necessary. It should be faithful to the text, but also free with the aim to recreate original meaning, trying to evoke the same feelings and emotions as the original text. Translation is an interpretation and a recreation, a very close reading and very precise rewriting trying to hold on to the meaning as well as the beauty of expression. That makes translation a very complex process with many pitfalls and challenges. In translation processes, you have the text, the reader, and the translator. The translator must possess creative writing skills, skills himself, sensibility of his own, and he must be able to recreate a new text of his own using his poetic creativity, his knowledge of the other culture and history, and his knowledge of the target audience. So his competencies do not only comprise also his awareness of his knowledge. So an ideal translator should not be only should not only be bilingual but bicultural. He should be rooted in two cultures, the abode of his own, and have an intimate knowledge of the target audience. Of course, which is a very big challenge. Now, in the following, I have chosen to share with you some of my difficulties in translating Arabic poems, which were written in uh, in non in Fusha, but in uh, colloquial Arabic. As for the choice of what to translate, a lot depends on coincidence and personal taste. For me, the precondition is that the poem has to speak to me. It has to tell me something. It has to touch something in me. Without this spontaneous, intuitive pre-understanding, I would never dare translate anything. As T.S. Eliot once said, even without fully understanding every word of a poem, you may still enjoy and love it. And this initial spontaneous appreciation is essential for me. For this presentation now, as I said before, I have chosen a poem by Mudaffar al-Nawab, 
written in the southern Iraqi dialect of Amara. In academia, usually the only literature discussed and translated is that of standard Arabic. However, poetry in Amiya has also played a great role and still does in Arab culture. This fact is often neglected, denied or ignored, mostly for ideological reasons, since from the end of the 19th century, a standardized form of modern Arabic was regarded as the basis for achieving a renaissance of Arab culture and modern national education. Various forms of Arab nationalisms denied the right of existence to dialectal literature. In analogy, in scholarship, colloquial poetry has received less attention and less study than Fusha poetry. While Fusha was always considered a tool against colonialism, the colloquial, however, gave the poet the chance to express his message of social criticism directly and precisely and to rouse collective sentiments. In Egypt, Sha'ad al amiya is a distinct poetical movement as from the 1950s onwards, established by poets such as Fuad Haddad and Salah Jaheen as a fusion of the more modern trends in Arabic poetry and the traditional forms. Now, the Iraqi poet Mudaffar al Nawab is often called the revolutionary poet of Iraq. He has been a member of the Iraqi Communist Party. He was sentenced to death in 1963, which was later commuted to a life uh, sentence. He escaped from the very bad, notorious prison, Nukrat Salman, in the middle of the Iraqi nowhere desert, and he hid in the southern marshes. Finally, he left Iraq for good, roaming around in the Arab world, settling down in Damascus, at least prior to the Syrian war now. And I think meanwhile, he's living between Iraq and the Emirates. In an interview in 1999, he defines uh, the difference between colloquial and fusha poems. I quote, both colloquial and fusha poems have their own merits and priorities and their own universe. It is like working with completely different material. To carve a rock is totally different from molding the clay. The grammatical nature of fusha could be called a rock, which has to be sculptured. There is grammar and linguistic rules and rhetoric devices and the dominance of the literary traditional canon. Colloquial poetry is like clay since it is indulgent. It is distant from grammar and the rhetoric heritage which binds the fusha poet to certain dimensions. The deflections of the dialect and the possibilities to assemble words allow the poet such an abundance and freedom to derive new words which don't exist and to give them meaning. In classical Arabic, this is not possible. Now, the most famous of Nawab's early colloquial poems, which has earned him immediate and lasting fame in Iraq, is entitled Lil Rail Wa Hamad, for the train and for Hamad. What struck me first when I read it was its inner melody and rhythm, the sound and softness of the language. I will quote only the first two stanzas here, which set the scene of farewell and departure. Lil Rail wa Hamad, Marina bikum Hamad wa ahna biqtar al lil, wa sama'ana digga gahwa wa shamana rihatin. Ya rail, see had a kahar, see had ashk ya rail. هودر هواهم ولك حضر الصناب القطا يا بو محابس شظر يا الشاد خزمات يا ريل بالله عبغنج من تجسي بوم شمات ولا تمشي مش يد هجر قلبي بعد ما مات وهودر هواهم ولك حضر الصناب القطا I don't know for the ones who don't speak Arabic my yeah not so very poetic translation for the train and for Hamad, we passed by you, Hamad, sitting in the night train, hearing the grounding of coffee beans, smelling sweet cardamom. O oh, train, howl of misery, howl of yearning, O oh, train. Their love has grown, my dear, the partridge hidden in the grain. Hey, you with the turquoise ring who fixed the golden nose ring. O oh, train, by God, slow down when the one with the mole passes by. Don't leave, don't go away. My heart has not yet died. Their love has grown, my dear, the partridge hidden in the grain. Now the poem in itself consists of 10 stanzas. 
each one with four lines, last of which forms the refrain. The poem is composed as a dialogue between the girl sitting in the train, passing by, and the train passing by. The first stanza is the girl who's heard his pair of not being able to eat the lava, yet being so close. Is symbolized in the train's screeching wheels. The second stanza, Ahmad, adding to the image of the beautiful girl, the mole and the golden ring, and confirming his love for her. Like her, he addresses the train directly, this time by calling the wagons to slow down when passing and blaming them for not stopping and letting him meet her. He's in a state of despair and sorrow. Throughout this dialogue, the train remains the first address for both of them. The dialogue between the two entails a change in perspectives that interweave and complement each other, being bound together by the same refrain. The refrain introduces the third perspective, the anonymous narrator commenting on their love. So in fact, the poem consists of the dialogue of the two lovers plus the third voice of the train. Now, the southern Iraqi dialect, I'll switch back to the southern Iraqi dialect. Um, the southern Iraqi dialect in which this poem is composed is inspired by rural songs and rhythms, and many words are not found in dictionaries. The idiomatic expressions are quasi incomprehensible without explanations and comments. And to further complicate things in internet and pirate copies, you find a plethora of variations with diverging and lacking verses. These different versions of the poem make academic analysis rather a challenge. In my translation, I have followed the explanations of the Iraqi scholar Abdul Wahid Lukla in his article Mudafar Anawa Fi Qatar al Layl from 2009, without which I would have been lost. Now, for me, the refrain has been the most difficult part to understand. Without the comments of Lukla, it would have been impossible. The word Haudar. Comments are ranging from increasing, getting stronger, getting firmer, to dwindling, vanishing. Lu'lu'a interprets it as to grow, some interpretation which I have followed, because it makes sense. In the, uh, di in the dictionary of Iraqi Arabic, the word is not listed at all, and in the web, contradictory explanations are given. Another example in the second uh, stanza, Shada. The Iraqi dictionary gives the meaning to the past blue, and comments on the internet say golden. But uh, even more problematic is the semantic level. The meaning of the partridge, al-Gatta. The image of the partridge hidden in the grain can only be understood knowing that the breasts of the girl are hidden beneath her voluminous blonde hair, sanabul, like birds hide in the cornfield. This imagery draws on beauty ideals common not only in rural Iraq. The partridge, with its erotic undertones, constitutes the main metaphor of the poem, which characterizes the inner feelings, the sexual longings and yearnings of both of them. The female body takes on a special function in this context. Not only does it constitute the focus of male desire, but also the girl herself speaks freely about her own desire. Now, of course, many questions are open for the translator. First, the dialect. Should we translate such a poem into standard, standard language, which means ignoring the subtleties of the original dialect? Or should we translate it into a German or an English dialect? Me as a non-native English speaker, that would have been in any case impossible, but it's a principal question. To me, it would sound wrong, but it's a question open for discussion. Second, Lu'lu'a claims that the verses are composed in the traditional meter of Basid, yani mustaf'ilun fa'ilun, mustaf'ilun fa'ilun. The Arabic original has an inner melodiousness, which is supplemented by the colors of its imagery, gold and silver, night and stars, the wind and the cool morning breeze, everything happening at night or in the early morning. While I have somehow tried to get a rhythm, kind of rhythm into, my, into the translation, the rhyme poses a much bigger challenge. Apart from the fact that I'm not a native English speaker, to rhyme would mean also to sometimes 
be obliged to alter the natural flow of words, which would be wrong in this context, or to create a whole new poem. I'm coming to the end with some, with some general remarks. Now, while poetry has been considered traditionally the most highly esteemed medium of expression in the Arab world, in the Western world, generally poetry has no wide audience. From my own experience, I know only very few Europeans who actually read and enjoy poetry. Let's hope that the winner of the Nobel Prize 2020, the US American poetess Louise Gluck, may trigger a bit more interest in poetry. However, a lot has already changed in the past 30 years when I first started to translate. Literary translations seem to be having a renaissance nowadays. The Man Booker International Prize Committee has decided to reward the translator of the winning novel together with the author on equal conditions. That is something really good. And there are a lot of other efforts to trigger translation, especially here in the Gulf, or with you in the Gulf, many literary prizes have sprung up and have stimulated translators and have created a new awareness of the, necess of the necessity of the need for translations. We are living in a global world where understanding the other without prejudice and discrimination is essential. Knowledge of the other is a precondition for peace. This is something which Dr. Sadiq has already mentioned in his keynote speech. And cross-fertilization and inspiration is a vital asset without which commonly shared goals are not possible. So even if Robert Frost is right in claiming that poetry is what gets lost in translation, against all odds and all challenges that we face and perhaps sometimes also cannot master, we will continue to translate. Poetry deserves to be read. The audience deserves to have access to poetry from all around the world. And also perhaps translations may be a stimulus to learn other languages so as to read poetry in the original language. Thank you for your attention. Dear all, I would like to thank Dr. Leslie for her comprehensive presentation. Let me now invite our fourth speaker, Professor Igor Mavir from the University of Ljubljana, Slovenia to present his paper titled, James Macaulay's Translations of George Trakel's Poetry. Professor Mavir is a full professor of English and American literature and head of the literatures in English section in the Department of English at the Faculty of Arts. Dear Professor Igor, the microphone is yours. Let's shift to the questions now. Thank you, Professor Carl. Um, there is a question for Dr. Lisley. You get to uh, as well, Dr. Lisley, at end. What are the most challenging obstacles involved in literary translation in general? What are the most challenging obstacles in literary translation in Yeah, thank you for this question. I think I tried to uh, explain that it's not only, it's the cultural concepts which have to be an, an analogy or shape. There must be something shared ground on which to meet. I think that's the most difficult, that's the most difficult challenge. Apart from the fact, of course, I mean, I have chosen this poet poem in Iraq. Dialect, which is very difficult for me as non-native speaker. Apart from the fact that uh, uh, translation of or understanding of the text itself, thank you, Doctor. شكرا يا دكتورة ليزلي. هناك سؤال آخر للبروفيسور سادلر. أين درست اللغة العربية؟ is for Dr. Leslie as well, if I can. Oh, okay. سؤال للدكتورة ليزلي مرة أخرى. Yeah. Could I ask? Um, I, I, one of my um, former students, Sophie Collins, writes about. Intimacy in literary translation, and I was really struck when you were speaking about 
the way that might fit into translating dialectal versus Fusha poetry and the way you were talking about dialect poetry is very much something lived and felt. And, and you spoke as well about wanting to translate the poem because it really made you feel something which made me think of that kind of aspect of intimacy. Is this something you've thought about and do you think that's really important in literary translation and particularly when we're translating dialectal poetry? Uh, thank you, Dr. Neil. I, I think that's a very important question and I'm not sure if I uh, can answer that uh, satisfyingly. Uh, for me, when I translated Narir Muhammad Nawab, it has been for academic uh, purposes. I, I did not intend to to publish a literary analysis which would really be published as a, as a work of art in itself. And I am not sure how to do it. I, I mean, I, I told about the open uh, questions, what to do with colloquial poetry? Should we, should we translate it into colloquial German, colloquial English? For me, that does not sound right. And uh, my experience of, uh, of uh, translating poetry written in uh, colloquial, which is for Nawab, and I have translated some of the Nabati poetry from Abu Dhabi um, into, into German, of course, is that I have always chosen high, normal German, of course. So I'm not really a specialist in literary uh, translation theory. And I'm not sure because I hear uh, Sadiq or someone <laughs> always translating my questions. No, just that she wrote about um, intimacy being uh, almost a requirement, but she was writing, she's a poet first and a translator uh, second, so it's almost the opposite perspective, I think. Which is a very good precondition uh, for uh, having good uh, translations. Uh, yeah. so thank you anyway for your answer. Uh, uh, there is another question for Dr. Uh, Professor Neil. What is, what, is, what is the future of translation in the era of machine translation? Thank you. Can we have the translation on a separate channel? As Leslie was saying, it's very distracting having very uh, distracting. both at the same time. Um, okay, I'll answer. Um, I think. Uh, excuse me. Can I just say one thing about regarding the translation? Because um, you need to press the globe and then mute original audio. Once you mute your, the original audio, just press again Chinese. Like this, you will not be able, uh, whoever is listening to the interpretation will be listening to the interpretation by itself. So you will not be listening to Arabic and English. So I press Chinese, that's what I need to do. Either you, you yes, said. in case that's you're listening you to both. The miracle okay. of technology <laughs> and translation. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> Just give this a try. Sure, okay. no worries. Yeah. Um, so I think this Art, the, the yeah. machine translation, this is what the datification idea is really meant to get at. Uh, I, uh, oh, I can still hear it. Never mind. I will speak anyway. I think there's often this idea that the human translator will disappear. And I don't think that's true. I think what will happen is far more complex than that. And that's what it's the fact that data, the processing of data, and the human become ever more tightly intertwined. And I think that is what we're seeing still remain in the loop. The question, I think, 20, 30 years from now is what exactly that position will be. I mean, there's a number of different There's this machine translation post-editing thing. There's adaptive machine translation, where machines do the translation, but building on the style of an individual translator and feeding from their individual memory. And more widespread than either of those is still just translation memories feeding into you know, supporting human translators. 
So yeah, I think it can go in a number of different ways. And I don't think any one of these will necessarily dominate. It seems like they're suited to different types of translation, different tasks. And it may well be that new forms altogether emerge as this continues. Thank you, yeah. Professor Neil. Uh, I'll go back to Professor Igor. I don't know if the... Yeah. So um, I'm going to talk about um, a well-known Australian poet and his uh, verse translations of an, Austri of an earlier Austrian poet. Uh, and um, in this case, I contend that uh, in translations, in verse translation, um, meanings and uh, f figures of speech, etc., uh, can not only be lost, but also gained, right? So James Macaulay's uh, posthumously published book of Georg Trakel's poems rendered in his superb English translations titled Music in the Mirabel Garden, Georg Trakel uh, from 1982 was published six years after the death of this highly acclaimed Australian poet. Georg Trakel on the other hand was an anguished prolific poet from Salzburg in Austria who had very early taken refuge in drugs and alcohol and was in 1914 called up as a reserve officer and a war pharmacist at the Galicia front during World War I. Overcome by the grief of his sister's greatest death and the victims of the Battle of Grodek, which he so movingly depicted in one of his you know, most famous poems, he was later taken to a military hospital uh, mentally disturbed where he poisoned himself at, a, at an early age of 27. The main feature then, if I sum it up, is uh, that drew uh, James Macaulay to a girl tackle was the image of the world as decay, death, and utmost despair. Although the fonts and origo of these, of course, uh, is to be looked for uh, elsewhere with both poets. In Trakel's quote unquote image filled expressionist poetry, unquote, in which images interact as colors in a painting, often resulting in strong synesthetic effects. The colors are literally, we may say, shouting at the reader. James Macaulay's early poems were in the 1930s, for the most part, uh, published in the Sydney literary magazine Hermes. Um, by 1936, the themes of woeful passion, love, and death emerge in his verse, showing strong, somber influences of the French symbolists. Despair is one of the ba basic traits in his late collection, Music Late at Night, poems 1970-1973. Not to forget the visible use of symbolic elements and subtle color language. Not only can the link between the symbolists, such as Verlaine and Rimbaud, the French poets, and James Macaulay be drawn along these lines, for the decadent late romantics too, represented a significant source for the young and the old Macaulay. In 1938, he wrote an MA thesis on symbolist poets and was uh, very much familiar and influenced with, uh, by the French decadent poets, especially Charles Baudelaire, on whom he modeled some of his early works. Uh, well, he was, uh, you know, influenced by Baudelaire's Les Fleurs du Mal, The Flowers of Evil. It should be emphasized that Macaulay's remark about Georg Trakel's decadence mostly eluded critical reviews uh, of Ma uh, Macaulay's work so far. He himself writes that in Trakel's work, quote, traces of the stage properties of early 20th century literary decadence linger here and there, end of quote. The decadent and symbolist quality most certainly helped to incite the young Macaulay to translate, and of course, later on also, uh, the Austrian poet uh, Trakel um, into English. Looking more closely now at James Macaulay's late poems from Music Late at Night, in terms of the affiliations, 
um, it has uh, with Tarkov's poem. Um, we can say that there are some um, distinct characteristics of poetic diction that hold true for both of them. In the opening poem, World on Sunday, from time given, there are an irregular but still very persistent use of rhyme, short statements, a downright powerful imagist imagery with impressionist undertones, as well as a recurrent use of the image of the moon set against the ever-changing sky, both taking on explicitly symbolic significance. And you will note here that I use the word affiliation uh, rather than only, you know, influence, right? So I quote here from um, uh, Music Late at Night. Brown lilac, roses filled with rain, hay fever streaming off mown grass. Disordered beds where we have lain, life and death offered at mass. It isn't easy to explain. I turn back from the sunset stain, a huge moon, yellow, like dull brass, lengthens my shadow down the lane." End of quote. A huge moon, quote, yellow like dull brass, bears an ominous significance for the poet, uh, quote, lengthening his shadow and thus reducing his existence from a, from a human being, from a real human being to a shadow. The reference to the, quote, sunset stain is intriguing. For the common stock metaphor from the romantic arsenal is turned upside down. Generally pleasant is for the speaker the stain of man's mortality, a sight one should turn away from. On the other hand, the simile used for comparing the moon to dull brass is not all that startling, but its recurrent use makes it the symbol in the, in the entire collection uh, I'm looking at here. Nocturne is a beautifully rendered impressionist depiction of the melancholic feeling with the absent poetic persona. This time, the setting is clearly set in Australia, probably in Macaulay's Tasmania. Uh, it should be said that Macaulay tried to somehow balance out the European Salzburg settings of the poems um, and on the other hand, uh, the Australian locales where he, uh, of course, or comes from and uh, where he lived. Quote, a gull flies low across the darkening bay. Along the shore, the casuarinas sigh. Resentful plowers give their ratcheting cry from the mown field scattered with bales of hay. The world sinks out of sight. The moon congealed in cloud seems motionless. The air is still." End of quote. In the poem, Private Devotions, we see the poet's characteristic treatment of the moon again. The gray clouds are still there, but it is essential to note the poet's possible allusion. It's not only possible, it's actually quite, quite clear, I would add, uh, allusion to Percy B. Shelley's and his, uh, Shelley and his short lyric, the the waning moon, which by extension also, de also determines the poet's own stance. I'm not going to quote Shelley here, just, just Macaulay quote, gathered starlings chatter loud in the late night, the clock, uh, the clock tower chimes, ghostly pale a full moon climbs out of the folds of linen cloud, end of quote. So the ghostly pale moon thus in both cases, well, in the case of Shelley and, um, and Macaulay, um, uh, quote unquote, climbs out of her chamber, shrouded in her, quote unquote, gauzy veil. It stands, I would say, for a hypersensitive, isolated and lonely romantic poet, shunned by society and at large. Uh, this is the case, this is so because of, of his difference. And, uh, and as a result of this, he is overtaken by despair. Geographical references are, on the other hand, very obvious in the poem uh, from the collection In the Gardens, uh, which um, was written during James McAuley's visit to Trakel's native town of Salzburg in 1973. 
The Mirabel Castle and Park the gardens included are set in the heart of the old town of Salzburg, not far from Trakel's home, now turned into a museum boasting exquisite 18th century monuments um, in, in the town itself. So the gardens with its rose garden, orangery and statues of dwarves, fountains reflect the French type of symmetrical, as it is called uh, Jardin à la Française and represent a symbol of power and glory in a, let's call it fearful symmetry of the Baroque period. The speaker of the poem uh, by, by, um, tr uh, by Traco called In the Gardens practically follows in Traco's footprints, brooding over transcendence, uh, over the transcendence of the vision of the nymph's blank eyes. This is a quote, so much reminiscent of Traco's form, quote, who looks, quote, with dead eyes after shadows that glide into the dark. So here I'm going to quote both, uh, just a few lines. First of all, uh, Macaulay, softly gleams the lily pond, a laid bee hovers round the, round the rose, and the gentle nymph's blank eyes seem to seek and see beyond the park, the city, and the skies. And now Traco, uh, earlier, of course, much earlier, uh, ancestral marble has gone gray. A bird flight wavers into space. A fawn looks with dead eyes after shadow, shadows that glide into the dark, quote unquote. So we can see the, let's call it, affiliation. In watercolor, the poem, we are suddenly, um, okay, I'm, I think I'm going to skip this in order to keep the, 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 the good time. The title poem of the collection, Music Late at Night, bears a clearly Traclan stamp. The shadows of black, white, and red colors decay the quote-unquote soulless music of bells and clouds of grief and despair. The poet uh, evidently wrote this poem in the small hours when even the moon, quote, uh, sails cold and the empty streets wait for the new day to commence with a new beginning. But this time there will be no second chance the poet feels because the despair is just too overpowering, quote, the rigid silence is complete. The music that the speaker of the poem hears in the Mirabel Gardens is the music of silence, late at night, announcing the arrival of the end, death, and strongly reflecting, this is a biographical in, you know, detail here, strongly reflecting also Macaulay's knowledge of his incurable disease he was suffering from and of which he died only a couple of years later. Trakel's poem, Gil Trakel's the poem, the Austrian poet, uh, Suburb in the Fern, clearly shows also his uh, romantic exoticized nature. Trakel even introduces elements of exoticism and the wish to escape to far away unknown places, such as, for example, the land with the quote unquote, rose colored mosques. The poet notices um, in the afternoon sky beams of strong sun rays emerging through a sporadic cloud as on the paintings by, by Flemish painters. In his daydreaming, he imagines them bringing a different kind of life. We see a tentatively called romantic um, maybe downright orientalist, I would say, kind of nostalgia for the medieval distant past in, quote, fine carriages, gallant horsemen. The use of colors here possibly suggests the influence of Arthur Rimbaud, the French poet, uh, while a similar escapist theme can be found also in Tarko's poem, Decay. So here, obviously, in terms of themes and, and you know, um, the coloring, uh, the language coloring is um, very, overlaps constantly between uh, the origin, let's say, between uh, Tarko and, and Macaulay's verse. So here, if I, if I may um, 
quote uh, from Trakl's Decay, which was translated into English um, by, um, precisely by James Macaulay. Quote, out of clouds, shimmering avenues emerge, complete with fine carriages, gallant horsemen. The one sees a ship run aground against cliffs, and often there are rose-colored mosques, end of quote. An example of Trakl's decadent streak, which has surpri surprisingly passed almost unnoticed by the critics, is the poem Farm Girl. It is highly reminiscent of Baudelaire's depiction of the beautiful and at the same time rotting aspect, uh, sorry, aspects of an, of an object, of a, of, of, of a, of a person, um, but um, even more so of Ellen Poe, Edgar Allan Poe's iconographic usage of the death of a young beautiful woman, such as, as in Annabel, Annabel Lee. The figure of the farm girl in, in the case of uh, Trakl thus appears in striking contradictions in a decadent you know, uh, vein. So youth, um, death, beauty, and on the other hand, rotting decay. The distant tinkle of a bell similarly to Macaulay's poems indicates the state of mourning uh, while the originally blue sky gets covered by black cloths um, as the farm girl's death becomes imminent. The imagery of decay used is downright imagist and decadent, again, shocking and effective. Um, the, the girl's, the farm girl's mouth is compared to a wound uh, buzzing with flies, which again brings Baudelaire to mind and, and his um, poem, uh, uh, A Carrion for uh, Queen Sharon. So to conclude, um, the para, uh, the, in terms of the affiliations between the two poets, so on the one hand, James Macaulay, the Australian poet who was fascinated uh, by Trakl and who translated it, uh, who translated him into English, we can say that both poets um, display a divided soul in romantic agony, torn between the depths of despair and especially in Macaulay, um, affirmative hope. Um, not so much, of course, on, 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 in the case of uh, Traka. Um, the reasons for despair and hope at the same time are in, in are quite different for the two for the two um, for the two poets uh, nonetheless because um, of course Traco being um, haunted and and uh, but well by the by the um, casualties and the horrors of the Great War, the First World War, his view is, um, is expressionist also. Um, there is the feeling of um, despair um, and it's, his poems are of course far darker than, uh, than uh, Macaulay's own or poems. Um, um, the ghostly pale moon, this is a quote from um, the poem, and leaden sky are present in the verse of both poets. They actually use the, the, the same words, the same syntax, writing out of decay, both of them. Uh, the moon possibly representing their solitary neo-romantic nature, isolation and outcast state, which in turn throws them into disgust in the case of Tarkal and despair in the case of Macaulay. Comparing them, the two poets, one can contend that they're really romantics at heart, but with symbolism being more explicit in the case of Macaulay and decadence as well as expressionism in the case of uh, Georg Tarkal. Through Trakl's decadent strain and uh, fin de siècle affiliations, there's, there are quite a few of, you know, not only Baudelaire, Rimbaud, but also Georgi. So uh, there are many, many um, uh, allusions and affiliations there to be found. Um, so 
whom Macaulay, so translated, he, Macaulay translated Strakel, as, as I mentioned uh, earlier. And um, it is safe to say that he's fascinated, Macaulay is fascinated not only by Strakel, but also all these other, um, you know, decadent expressionist poets uh, that had in turn influenced Strakel himself, right? So a kind of indirect uh, influence uh, or in, in affiliation there in, in this case. Um, so finally, uh, Georg Trakl was a major literary influence on Macaulay's especially late verse, which has passed unnoticed so far, which was, so uh, Macaulay's late verse, which was um, linguistically and culturally mediated through Macaulay's fine verse translations, which work either way in a kind of two-way passage. A fine verse translation is always a translatio, a transfer. We know, of course, that it is a mediation. So uh, a transfer from a liter to- Excuse me, Professor Mavir. Excuse yeah. me, you have two minutes to, to finish, please. Thank you very much. Thank I'm you just, so much. Just about to be, to Thank finish. You. So um, these translations, they work uh, either way. Um, and um, a transfer from a literal to a figurative meaning. Um, um, so much more, they of course, uh, much more than just uh, some sort of word for word transposition, especially when we're talking about uh, poetry. Um, and in this case, um, the, there are things that are gained in this process, not only lost in translation as we, as we often hear. Um, I, I would have shown you also my PowerPoint, but because of my you know, microphone problems, um, I, I was unable to do so, but thank you for, for being patient with me and thank you for your attention. Dear all, I would like to thank Professor Igor for his profound presentation. With the fourth presentation, the session is coming to an end. Let me say that I enjoyed the session and I would like to thank the speakers and the conference followers for their participations. Now we have a short break and the coming session will start shortly. Please do not go away and keep following the conference activities. Thank you and goodbye.
dear respectable speakers and followers, welcome to the National Archives First Translation Conference, Translation in the Digital Age between Modern Technologies and Challenges of Historical Text. I am Shahinaz Nagar speaking to you from Abu Dhabi, and I will chair the second session entitled Globalization Mechanisms and Translation Methods in the Digital Age. In this session, we have four distinguished speakers who will present their papers. Each one will be given a time between 15 and 20 minutes at maximum. At the end of the presentations, five to 10 minutes will be given for short questions and answers. Now I invite Professor Charlotte Bousseau from the University of Edinburgh. In her presentation, she's going to discuss identity in translation, multilingualism in Jane Diversion and its French, French and Spanish versions. Dr. Charlotte Bousseau is a senior lecturer in translation studies at the University of Edinburgh. Her current research interests include voice performance and characterization in audiovisual materials. She currently writes on documentaries dealing with gender-based violence, investigating how the voices of women are translated in this context. Dr. Charlotte Bousseau, the microphone is yours. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, and can you see yeah. my presentation? Yes, yeah? you're okay. sharing your, your uh, screen, right? Yes, yes I'm sharing. You can see your screen, yeah. Yeah, okay, thank Please you. Go on. Thank you. Well, thank you for this introduction. I'm very pleased to be here, well, virtually to present uh, my paper. So I'm going to talk to you by identity in translation. Uh, and to do that, I'm going to take the American TV series, Jane the Virgin, uh, and look at multilingualism and how it has been translated in the French and Spanish version. And I'm going to reflect on identity in translation in that context. So to talk about uh, identity, I um, consider the concept of liminality. So a liminal space is a realm of pure possibility whence novel configurations of ideas and relations may, may arise. So it's an in-between space. It's the space where new meanings can be introduced and is characterized by its ambiguity and its openness. So it's a period of transition that paves the way for something new. And what I argue is that multilingualism in audiovisual products, so multilingualism is the ability to speak more than one language. So multilingualism in audiovis audiovisual product is or can be seen as a liminal space characterized by its openness and its ambiguity because uh, characters are speaking two languages uh, and their identity are being negotiated and constructed through this linguistic diversity. So be, they belong to at least two cultures and they can switch from one language to another when they speak. And their conversations only make full sense in this particular liminal space. So this in-between space uh, where one person speak one language and another sp a person speak another. So to talk about this, I'm considering the American TV series, Gender Virgin, which is a satirical American telenovela that uh, uh, is streaming on Netflix, but was created by the network CW and has five seasons, so 100 episodes, or are they are called chapters. So it's a multilingual American TV series that is set in Florida. And because it's set in Florida, English and Spanish coexist, so the character speaks these two languages, and it's, it's centered around the life of the Villanuevas. Uh, and as you can see on this picture, we have Jane in the middle eating a, a sandwich. On the right, we have her grandmother, uh, Alba, and on the left, we have her mother, and they love watching telenovelas. So Jane the Virgin is about Jane, who, whose life is like a telenovela. And Jane is a virgin, but because of an um, accident at um, a gynecological checkup, she's being inseminated artificially, and then she will uh, have a child. So you can see how it is uh, a telenovela, and it is satirical. So Jane is multilingual because uh, Jane, as a third generation immigrant, speak, speak English and Spanish in her daily life. Um, so it means that Jane and her mother, Shomara, 
speak to each other in English, but they understand Spanish perfectly. And then they speak to Alba, so the grandmother or Shomara's mother, in English, but Alba always responds in Spanish, even if she speaks English. So their conversations are always in both languages, and it's a symbol of intimacy. So you can see that English and Spanish have play very important roles in the series because Spanish is the language that binds the villain with us. And they have a very tight circle because Jane was solely raised by her mother and her grandmother. We also have other characters. I don't have the time to speak about all of them, but we have Michael Cordero, who is Jane's fiance, Rogelio de la Vega, who is her father, and Rafael Solano, who is the father of Jane's baby. Michael is important to mention because he's American and he doesn't speak Spanish. So when he goes to family gatherings, he doesn't have access to what Alba says and he needs a translation. Rogelio, on the other hand, uh, is a telenovela actor of Mexican descent. So he speaks Spanish and English in different contexts. He speaks Spanish in the telenovelas, but also with Alba, and he speaks in English uh, with Jen and Chumara. So the character and casting is important because Spanish and English have different functions and the casting reflects, uh, the casting choice reflects the show's linguistic diversity and the shows has been said to give an accurate depiction, depiction of Latinos and Latinas in the US. So it's a multilingual, multi-ethnic and multicultural show and the languages spoken by the characters are important parts of who they are, that is their identity and relationship. And Spanish, as I mentioned, is the language of the insiders, those who belong to the close uh, family circle of the Villan Weavers. So in terms of identity and characterization, we can say that Jane is a type of polyglot product uh, because polyglot films are characterized by their realistic use of languages to accentuate and celebrate linguistic diversity. So Jane the Virgin is a polyglot multi multilingual TV series with a focus on language difference because uh, two languages are spoken, communication, how these languages are used and translation. And the main purpose of this multilingualism is to give an authentic depiction of language, of the language reality of first, second, and third generation immigrants. So it is used as a vehicular matching. So the languages are represented as they, were, they are or would be in a bilingual uh, household. The second function is to show this intimate bond between the villain weavers because Alba, the grandmother, can speak her mother tongue freely and her daughter and granddaughter do not need translation and vice versa. So knowing and speaking Spanish is an important aspect of belonging to their tight-knit clan. So it's used for intimacy, but also, on the other hand, for confusions, because when characters do not speak Spanish, they will need translation. And in that case, Jen and Shomara become accidental interpreters. Now, because Jane is an American production, English is the main language and Spanish is the second language. They coexist alongside uh, each other. And this situation reflects an authentic use of bilingualism in the family of many immigrants in the US where Spanish is the first uh, foreign language spoken. And to portray this uh, on screen, Code switching and code mixing is used. So code switching or mixing in, uh, is a momentary yet seemingly complete switch from one language to the next for the duration of a word, a syntax, or one or more proposition. And it's a very common feature of multilingual communities. So it is used uh, in multilingual films, polyglot films as well. In Jane the Virgin, Part subtitling is thus used to show this subtitling. So here we have an example of Alba uh, telling Jane that she can never go back. She says this in Spanish in the original and it's subtitled in English. So the show is part subtitled in English. Now going back to this notion of the liminal space, code switching indicates this solidarity and intimacy between the different groups of people. Uh, and it has a special meaning that, uh, and the special meaning of multilingualism, so that intimacy 
points to its function as a liminal space. And that space is that Spanish is used by the Villa Nuevas in that space to signal belonging to a specific community and family. And the coexistence of these languages in polyglot products is important for identity construction, characterization as well, because identities are negotiated through linguistic diversity and the fact that you can speak different languages. Translating multilingualism has been studied a lot and the scholars agree that it is crucial to keep it because if the text becomes multilingual, monolingual, sorry, it will constrict the possibility for the new meaning, so the special bond, to be introduced in the target culture. Now, in spite of this, many scholars have shown that there is a leveling or flattening, neutralizing or homogenizing of multilingual, multilingual, uh, sorry, multilingual versions uh, in translation. In terms of translation, subtitling is said to be better than dubbing because that leads to an erosion of multilingualism. And its advantage of subtitling is that the soundtrack is kept so you can hear the voices, you can hear the code switching. But this assumption uh, that viewers can identify uh, the, the voices and the code switching has been questioned because are they so focused on reading that the subtitles, uh, that they forget uh, to, to listen? Uh, and we have very few audience studies uh, in audiovisual translation studies to show that preference, and we need some more. When we talk about um, translating multilingualism, we talk about translating L3. Uh, so L1 is the source language, so it's the, the language of the original, so English in this case, of Jane the Virgin. The target language uh, is the language of the translation, so if it's translated in French, it would be French. Uh, and L3 are the other languages. So Jane the Virgin is L1 English and L3 is Spanish. Now it's interesting because in translation, in Spanish translation, because the target language L2 is Spanish, they would be the same. So if the show is fully dubbed into Spanish, there won't be any difference between the different languages spoken as and Spanish as L3 would become invisible. And in French translation, so L2 is French, so if L1 English and L3 Spanish are fully dubbed into French, then we wouldn't have any multilingualism. So I did a case study uh, of, uh, of the show. I compared the dubbed and subtitled French version and the dubbed Spanish version to see how meaning uh, transition in translation, how identity uh, is impacted, uh, I looked at the translation strategies used um, and I've asked, do translations allow the viewers to access the multiple layers of meaning that are created by the multilingualism in the source text and show that special or intimate space uh, of multilingualism? So let's have a look at the French version. So the dub version. So in terms of code switching, so we have full sentences uh, in different languages. Now we have a few Spanish words that I kept. We have mija, that Jane, uh, that uh, the abuela, the grandmother used for Jane, uh, which is a term of endearment, meaning dear or honey. And when uh, Jane talks about her grandmother, she uses abuela. So this is kept, uh, this is kept in the French dub version. The telenovelas that they are watching in Spanish are subtitled in French. And so that is interesting because Rogelio, who acts in the telenovelas as well, means that he speaks Spanish in the telenovelas, but otherwise it's, he speaks French. So the two different functions are the same as in the original, but the problem is, is that he's got two voices. He's got his original voice in Spanish, and he has his French voice with no accent. And there is a continuity issue. When it comes to Alba, uh, she speaks French, uh, but she's given a very strong Spanish accent. So in, generally speaking, in terms of strategies, so code switching is limited to a couple of words, so abuela and mija, uh, and there is this accent for Alba, but not for Rogelio. So we could ask about the consistency of choice. 
For the subtitle version, so everything has been subtitled with no language information. We have the same strategies for code switching, so Mira and Abuela are kept. So generally, in terms of homogenization, uh, we can say that the space in which the languages were meeting has shrunk because we only have a couple of word of code switching and the rich meaning, uh, the rich meaning of uh, multilingualism is not conveyed. I would tend to say that the subtitled version is more homogenized than the dub version because in the dub version you have an other compensation, you have the accent for Alba. Um, and of course, the voices are audible, uh, but there's no indication of language uh, switch apart from Abuela and Miha. So one could say that the sub subtitled version puts more pressure on the viewer's ability to understand languages. When it comes to the Spanish dub version, as I said, it's challenging because L3, Spanish in the source text, is L2, Spanish in the target text. So what we have is that the whole soundtrack has been dubbed, but particularly actors have been dubbed by European Spanish, apart from Alba, who keeps a Latin American voice. That could be a financial choice because she already spoke Spanish, so why not keep it? Um, so that means that there is no language switch uh, for different situations. So there is no contrast between Rogelio as a father or as an actor of telenovelas. And there are no more multilingual conversations because everybody speaks Spanish. The voice translation strategy is quite similar to the French dub version because Alba has a marked accent and she has a Latin American voice, but not Rogelio. So one could ask again, why keep Alba's voice, but not his? There is also a difference in volume and clarity because Alba speaks with her original voice uh, and the sound of the dub track is louder and crispier, which create a sound mismatch, uh, which, uh, and which causes an uncanny effect as I have uh, written about in previous work. So in conclusion, we can say that multilingualism is flattened or neutralized, of course, to different degrees in the different version. So Alba in the French the version has a Spanish accent, which compensates somehow, and it works at some level, but we have to be careful with giving accents because they are attached stereotypes. In terms of representation, the Spanish accent for Alba is not an equivalent solution because Alba doesn't speak English with a Spanish accent in the original, she speaks Spanish. And it's within this space of code switching that her identity is constructed and constantly negotiated. So if Alba speaks French with an accent, her identity can be said to be limited to an accent, and this minimizes uh, her ability to construct and negotiate her identity, that is to be herself. So the French and Spanish audience have really no idea how much the different languages are being spoken, yet in the original, original they are able to understand each other, and this diversity is at the heart of their relationship and also a sign of belonging to this particular uh, community of the Venezuelan American. I don't think it makes any sense to dub the show into Spanish. A subtitled version would convey better the multilingualism and its function. For the French ve version, we could have a mixture of subtitling and dubbing, for instance, with English being dubbed into French and Spanish subtitled into French. So going back to this liminal space, so I mentioned before that the main functions of multilingualism is that of authenticity and intimacy, and they are lost in translation because they all speak the same language. So the specific meanings that are related to intimacy, but also the roles of languages um, are not Excuse conveyed me. to the French. Excuse me, Professor yeah. Charlotte. Uh, may I remind you that you still have only two more minutes to go? Please. Yeah, yeah, I'm on, almost finished. Thank you. Thank you. So the, the specific meanings that related to this intimacy and the role of the languages uh, that they play is not conveyed to the French or Spanish viewers. So they cannot appreciate uh, that uh, bilingualism is a special space for the villain weavers. It's a third space, an in-between space that they inhabit without questions 
uh, and when outsiders join, translation is needed, and it shows their position of that margin. So we have homogenized translations and the possibilities for new meanings to be introduced to the target cultures are limited, even in possible, particularly for Spanish, because L3 is invisible, invisible and there are no traces of multilingualism. So to finish, I would say that the conventional techniques are not working, uh, conventional translation techniques are not working, because Jane is a multilingual polyglot show in which identities are built and negotiated through linguistic diversity. We know that, uh, from, that translation is still seen as an afterthought in the film business or TV business, but multilingual films are successful and audiences are getting used to part subtitling, uh, to part subtitling and fan subbing techniques. So they are commercially viable. So to keep the liminal meaning of multilingualism, I think we could use mixed methods, so subtitling and dubbing, and creative techniques, for instance, color coding or italics, to replicate the viewing experience of watching a part subtitle multilingual products, but also uh, we need to work more closely with the film industry and Netflix in that context. So I think the next step is to have more audience studies to understand what audiences want uh, and need. And then we would have evidence that the audiences are ready for another type of translation that allows the liminal space of multilingualism to shine through. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank Professor Charlotte Bousseau for her insight for research and commitment to the presentation time. And now I would like to invite our second speaker, Professor Tariq Shamma from Binghamton University, New York, United States of America. He will present a paper entitled A Historical Anthology of Arabic Translation, Challenges and Prospects. Currently, Professor Tariq Shamma works at the Comparative Literature Department and Translation Research and instruction program at Binghamton University. He is the author of Translation and the Manipulation of Different Arabic Literature in 19th Century England. He is currently working at an anthology of Arabic discourse on translation, which is to be published shortly. Asad al Mutabi'ayin, the Istimal at Tergamal Fauria, Yurga Bulogal Arabia, Yurga Docht Al Al Koral Ardia, Eleti Tagidunaha. في الشاشة واختيار اللغة الصينية أو تشاينيز لأنه لا يوجد اللغة العربية فاختيار اللغة تشاينيز يتيح لكم الاستماع إلى الترجمة باللغة العربية To listen to the simultaneous interpretation in Arabic kindly click on the globe and select on Chinese language uh, This way you will be able to listen to the Arabic translation Professor Tariq Shamma, the microphone is yours Good morning, uh, or good afternoon. Assalamu uh, alaikum. I hope, can you see my presentation, the slides? Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, all right, as uh, Mrs. Uh, Najjar said, uh, I'll discuss this project that uh, I've been working on with, with a number of colleagues for several years called Anthology of Arabic Discourse on Translation, uh, Anthology of Tarzam and Arabia. Uh, so this, this, as I said, is the outcome of a multi-year research project to locate pre-modern Arabic texts that deal with translation in the form of reflection, commentary, or discussion. Uh, the early stage of the project involving the identification and collection of Arabic texts was supported with a three-year grant from Qatar National Research Fund which started in 2015. So I'm working with a number of colleagues at different universities as researchers and also as uh, with, a, with a number of research assistants in the United States and the United Kingdom and Qatar also. So this collection of texts, the anthology has resulted in a corpus which I will discuss and on, based on this corpus we produce uh, the book in Arabic, which is being published now by the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies in Doha. And in the English version, I just submitted the, the, the final version of the English version to Rockledge. 
the scope of the study extended from the earliest recorded instances of classical Arabic around the sixth century AD until the end of World War I, which we set as the conclusion of the pre-modern period uh, and the start uh, of the modern periods in the Arab world. Uh, within this timeline, uh, the texts have been extended, have been uh, divided into two broad historical periods. The classical period, uh, which, uh, as I said, starts with the 6th century until the 18th century, and the Nahda or the Arab Renaissance, this is 18th century to the early 20th century, 1918 specifically. So in, in, in the, our initial plan, uh, this is from the uh, classical period. This is Aristotle in an Arabic uh, manuscript. In, the, in, in our initial plan, the anthology was designed to focus on these two periods, and Nahda and the early Abbasid dynasty, which are the landmark periods of transition in, uh, in Arabic, in the history of Arabic. However, as we progressed further, and as more and more texts were collected, uh, it became clear that translation was present over such long periods and at such a scale that it cannot be limited to two discrete stages. Uh, so as a result, we had to expand the scope, uh, the scope of the first part of the book to span the entire pre nahda age, which is still quite broad, but maybe in the future we'll have more divisions. Uh, texts were investigated in all contexts, disciplines, and intellectual fields, regardless of the author's ethnicity or geographic location. So the corpus we collected uh, after several years consist consisted of around over 543 texts uh, of widely varying sizes, ranging from thematic series of articles in Nahda to brief notes of multiple lines, especially in, in the classical period. T texts were organized by historical periods of uh, centuries for the classical age and the decades for the Nahada age because of the uh, big disparity in the number of texts. We had 360 for Nahada and 183 for the classical age. In addition to the historical period, the texts in the corpus were target, uh, tagged by author and topic, the languages translated from and into or discussed and whether the extract was taken from a translated work, that is from paratexts, or, for, or from an original work. Uh, an additional criterion in the Nahda text was the medium of publication, because then we have journals and, uh, and periodicals. Now, the selection criteria. So how did we select the text from the corpus uh, to choose about 50, uh, what we consider to be more or less representative texts of general trends in the corpus? So here we try to provide a balanced representation of the main trends in the collected material uh, and to connect them as much as possible to contemporary historical problems uh, in the theory of translation or you know, in Arabic studies generally. So these criteria include, uh, first, originality. So this comprises texts that have not received sufficient attention, especially those dealing with new topics or tackling a common, a common topic from a different angle. The second one, which kind of uh, balances the, the first criterion, is the impact and wider recognition. So uh, some texts, though widely known in studies, cannot be left out of an anthology of this kind due to their influence and importance. Uh, third criterion is the size or length. Uh, while texts considered for selection were only those with a minimum amount of discussion of translation, just I mean, more than simply mentioning translation, the length varied, as I said. So due to the large size of the collective corpus, we decided to omit extremely short texts. Uh, and, but these were referenced sometimes in the discussion, in the commentaries, etc. The fourth uh, criteria, uh, criteria, uh, criterion is connection to significant social, political, or intellectual issues in the historical context of the text and potential contribution to historical research. Uh, five, uh, relevance to modern transition studies or fields. Uh, and of course, these are connected, either historical one or a modern one uh, perspective. Uh, relevance to current problems in Arabic studies, intellectual, cult cultural, or sociopolitical. And as we said, we try to balance these, uh, you know, using a modern perspective, but again, understanding the text in their historical context, not imposing our own uh, modern perspective on them. 
Finally, variety was an important uh, criteria, and we tried to maintain a multiplicity of topics, issues, and theoretical approaches, and to reflect a broad historical range. So this is the in, in the in the anthology we had the selected text, and we had each one had an introduction and commentary by one of uh, the researchers that emphasized and studied some of these uh, issues. Uh, so, we'll, uh, okay, and of course, this was the Arabic version, then the uh, English version was translated, uh, the Arabic was translated into English, and we have translators who work, and some of them are participants in the conference. Uh, finally, uh, so now I want to look at the main findings and the recommendations for further research that we had. So, first, uh, the findings. Um, uh, first, transition discourse in Arabic, which as I mentioned, continued throughout all historical periods at an intensity and variety arguably higher than previously assumed. So not only uh, the Abbasid period, the Asra Abbasid or the Nahda at all ages, at least discourse and translation, uh, not necessarily translation itself. The division, and this is why the division into per two periods of thriving translation, uh, when it comes to the discourse of translation seems arbitrary and, 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 and uh, inaccurate. Discourse on transition continued at all times. Uh, transition thinking in the classical period did not start until later in the Abbasid age. So actually, uh, it started uh, flourished subsequent to the flourishing of translation itself. Thus, the Abbasid age was not necessarily the golden age. The early Abbasid age was not necessarily the golden period for transition theory or conceptualization as opposed to transition production. Uh, so we have some famous texts from Al-Jahiz, for example, and Hunayn's Risalat Hunayn's epistle, but otherwise not a lot of discourse on transition during the actual active transition period. One phenomenon may help it, that may help explain the above observation is that translators did not seem to have themselves engaged in significant theorization about translation. Most discourse on translation, especially in the Abbasid period, was conducted by scholars in other disciplines, disciplines for various purposes, theologians and uh, literary critics and so on. A comparable disparity can be seen in the Nahda II, where original scholarly works were far more common vehicle for transition discourse than transition paratexts, which were mostly brief and cursory if they existed. Um, it is worth noting as well that many scholars in all ages, especially in the classical period, who discussed translation at length were not themselves translations, uh, translators. Uh, the fourth uh, observation is that uh, a related phenomenon is that the theory and practice uh, of transition were not or did not seem to be closely linked at all times. As stated above, reflection on translation did not necessarily derive from transition practice. <coughs> nor did it seem to influence the practice itself. Uh, this is especially the case with prescriptive approaches which subjected transition practice to predetermined theoretical rules. As in, for example, theological discussions about translations, like how many interpreters do we need for a judge or a ruler? This did not derive from, derived from theological principles, not necessarily from translation. Uh, finally, uh, Rebecca Gold states that no extent Arabic manifesto specifically adumbrates a methodology for translation. Now, it seems unrealistic, of course, <clears throat> to integrate ancient scholarship for theoretical tools that belong to the modern age, that is a manifesto of translation. Besides, of course, this statement overlooks sophisticated discussion of transition practice that can be seen uh, as precursors to a modern transition methodology. However, it is undeniable that transition in pre-Islamic history, sorry, in Arabic Islamic history was not seen as an independent discipline or as an art in its own right, uh, which seems to be the case for medieval transition generally, even in Europe and other places of the world, even in Asia. Uh, thus, transition, transition as interlingual transfer was grouped with different textual pra practices, such as explanation, exegesis, paraphrase, tafsir, or sharah, or talhis, etc. These are some of our, our main uh, observations. Finally, uh, we have some recommendations for further research. And this is mainly in, in the form of particular areas of research that 
uh, historical uh, research that require and warrant further studies and could be quite uh, and or seem quite promising. Uh, so these include um, several uh, several areas. Uh, first, interpreting. That was a very rich area, I think, uh, in Arabic that has not been studied. Uh, references to interpreters abound in all periods of classical Arab history. With the earlier rapid expansion of Islam out of the Arabian Peninsula, increasing contact with the populations of the conquered countries created new communication needs. Some of the most dramatic of these cases of interpreting can be found in early Islamic conquests of the lar uh, larger Near East, especially in Syria and Iraq. Interpreting is also a frequently referenced activity in classical Arabic travelogues. We also find examples of the widespread use of interpreting in various parts of the Islamic empire, especially in the newly conquered regions where Arabs and non-Arabs, Muslims or otherwise, interacted on all levels of government and administration, not to mention daily life. Uh, in fact, there are accounts of interpreters uh, as early as the Abbasid period. Interpreting was also quite important uh, during the Mamluk period, uh, 14th, 15th, 16th centuries, involving new languages in trade relations with Europe, <coughs> especially Italian cities like Pisa, Florence, and Venice. In addition to the Mamluks, at least the Hafsid, uh, Hafsid Hafsiyun in, in, in Tunisia, in 13th, 16th centuries had trade relations with European cities in which interpreters were central. And we have documents about the work of interpreters and treaties and so on. In fact, interpreting seems to have been a specialized and often profitable profession in these times where interpreters could be also assistants, commercial agents, and something of travel guides. Uh, community translation is another area. Further research is needed into the role of translation and mediating relations between Arabs and speakers of other languages and the conditions that emerge, especially after the adoption of Arabic as the official language of administration in, and law in regions where most speakers knew little Arabic. These needs uh, fueled Islamic legal debates about the possibility of using interpreting and translation in prayer, sermons, and other religious practices. Third, Bible translation. There has been a growing interest in recent years in Christian and Jewish religious writings in Arabic in the classical period, including translations. Uh, however, while substantial, this, uh, this heritage is beginning to be explored, especially in translation studies. In particular, most studies in Arabic and English have focused on theological and doctrinal questions, sometimes from a polemical perspective, like in the classical period. Little attention has been given to translation theory. Uh, in the numerous uh, Arabic translations of the Bible, for example, which have existed possibly since before Islam. Uh, Quran translation, uh, Tarjumat al-Quran. It may seem surprising to include the translation of the Quran, Quran among areas warranting further exploration as studies of the Quran translation is not in short supply today. However, current research, even translation studies have been concerned for the most part with issues of ajaz in addition, which is the inimitability or the impossibility of translating the Quran from the linguistic and stylistic uh, point of view. In addition to related linguistic, stylistic, and doctrinal questions in the process of translation. However, the linguistic, stylistic, and cultural issues raised in the collected text were not limited to this issue, to ajaz. Uh, some of them reveal original reflections on the theoretical and practical aspects of translation, even by theologians like Shatabi or Ibn Taymiyyah. Uh, no less interesting are other less studied Islamic writings dealing with prayer, sermons, and Islamic term terminology in general, and the role of translation in this. Finally, translation teaching, uh, pedagogy. Uh, although transition instruction and training is a relatively new area in transition studies, several texts from the Nahda point to a budding interest in this topic, seen in attempts to establish educational principles and strategies, uh, and especially for schools, teaching transition at schools, spe specifically in Egypt, uh, the, talk, the text that we found. Two factors seems to have, seem to have been particularly uh, uh, pertinent here. 
First, uh, Dar al Alson or the House of Tongues, first uh, founded under Muhammad Ali's patronage in Egypt in 1835 as the School of Translation, uh, Madras al Tarjama, that's what it was called in the beginning. So, the first translator training programs in the Arab world. More broadly, the second factor in transition uh, education is uh, educational reforms in the 19th century uh, in Egypt and uh, the Levant, especially, and Iraq, established modern public schools, which integrated the teaching of foreign European languages and sometimes translation. A salient feature of early educational methods, which is also a feature of early educational methods in transition generally, was the integration of translation with foreign language teaching to such an extent that they became inseparable. They talk about translation teaching and, uh, sorry, language teaching and translation as almost the same thing. Uh, you study the languages and you translate automatically almost. Still, we have come upon transition curricula from the early 20th century uh, that use sophisticated methodology by the standards of the time addressing transition techniques beyond proficiency in the two languages of transition. So this is generally uh, an overview of the project and our main findings and, and uh, recommendations. Um, thank you. I would like to thank Professor Tariq Shamma for his outstanding research and commitment to presentation time. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, now I invite our third speaker, Professor Salah Basalama from the University of Ottawa in Canada. Professor Basalama will present a paper entitled Translating Islam into Secularism and Vice Versa, a Dialogue Within Western Modernity. Professor Basalama currently works at the School of Translation and Interpretation in University of Ottawa. His fields of research include the philosophy of translation, translation rights, social and political philosophy, post-colonial cultural and religious studies, as well as Western Islam and Muslims. السادة المتابعين أذكركم مرة أخرى بأنه يمكنكم متابعة الترجمة باللغة العربية عبر ال... عبر الضغط على الكلة الأرضية واختيار اللغة الصينية أو Chinese نظرا لعدم وجود اختيار اللغة العربية ف الضغط فقط على اللغة السينية أو Chinese. Professor Basalama, kindly start your presentation, please. Thank you very much for uh, for this invitation. I'm glad to be a part of this uh, great conference. Um, so let's start. So a quick outline, I'm going to make an introduction and uh, introduce the issue of my talk, uh, asking four main questions as follows. And uh, I will finish with uh, some uh, illustrations and examples. Um, you can call it uh, case studies <clears throat> and uh, some uh, conclusion. So just to introduce my talk, since the Iranian revolution and more so in the wake of 9-11 uh, and other international events, the increasing visibility of Islam and Muslims on the world scene encountered many negative reactions in the secular West. Uh, for example, some uh, countries or uh, regions like Quebec would say that religion is kind of a return of the repressed. Reactions came from across the political class, cross sections of the public, and of course, amplified by the media, media mainly emphasizing the threat that Islam and Muslim may impose on Western societies, their cultural and religious norms, and their way of life. In many Western countries, this has led the politically represented secularized majority to act toward its religious minorities in a discriminatory manner in the name of secularism or laïcité, as in France or Quebec. <clears throat> on the one hand, on the other hand, sorry, homegrown terrorism and nonviolent fundamentalism have also shown that there is still a deep incomprehension of Western culture and the democratic context of pluralism by some Muslims in the West. Of course, 
The point here is not to portray Islam and Western Muslims as victims and blame their non-religious fellow citizens, but to view them as legitimate equals with their own rights and duties as lawful members of these societies. They think this equality in principle, which constitutes the basis of any translational relationship, is not only to be viewed as the national at the national level, but it should be also expected at the international level as well. So what's the issue at stake here? The question at stake in this paper is to explore the disposition of translation studies as a discipline to offer a conception of translation that allows beyond the linguistic aspect for a sociopolitical transformational process. In the increasing secularization of Western societies, what is the status and role of religions in their moral content? If secular and religious Muslim citizens are of equal value to the eyes of the neutral democratic state, what could be the function of translation in regulating their relationship? So the first question is, why translating Islam or secularism? Why speaking of translation in a common linguistic space? Because there is diversity, cultures, non-religions, religions and non-religions, and a plurality of reasons and logics. Because also there is a coexistence of differences, divergences, disagreements, misunderstandings and conflicts, of course, uh, of every kind. Their cultural differences speak different conceptual and symbolic languages, languages. When studying the phenomenon of Islamism, for example, François Burgard talks about the imperative of Western secularism to enable itself to translate the Muslim parlance into accessible language. And you have the example that Tariq Shama has uh, studied, which is Arab nationalists who used also a lot of this kind of parlance. The same duty of translation should apply to Muslims as well. On the one hand, this means that Muslims must integrate most of the values found in Western cultures, as long as they are not conflicting with their own. On the other hand, it also means that Muslims should translate themselves, that is, to translate their religious ethos into one that can be understood by most people. For Muslim citizens to be involved in Western political life, they need to translate the universal moral content of Islam into an idiom that most of their fellow citizens can comprehend. And here I refer to Habermas, and I'll come to it even more later. Understood in this sense, translation can be defined as a process of bi-directional decipherment taking place between or among different worldviews. Because this trend of translation takes place between remote and sometimes opposed frames of reference, it may be called interreferential translation. In the social philosophy of Habermas, it may be called the institutional translation proviso which we will come to later on a little more. So one propose, our proposed th thesis is as follows. Translating would suppose a dual understanding of both Western cultural and social history and Islam Muslims in their diversity. It means knowledge integration. Translating entails the production of a discourse that builds on an an accurate understanding of the source and an acceptable rendition of the target cultures at hand. This means knowledge production. Translating Islam or secularism would bring change to perceptions. It would not be considered as a foreign body threatening the existence of either identities, but as a part and parcel of its cohesion of the social fabric and the very condition of its cohesion, sorry. This means knowledge, impact, or transformation. So my second question out of the four that I have is what is there to translate then? 
There are many objects that can be translated from both sides. Translating understood in the meaning I have outlined uh, just before. A few examples from the Muslim vantage point. Women headscarf niqab is a lot of time is, is a big question in, in the West. So it is about debunking representation of submission to the country, which is emancipation. And religious practices, for example, a lot of questions about why so many prayers a day and different you know, uh, rituals that Muslims have and how to explain re these representations of religious duties in a secularized society is a question to be accountable to answer to. What about the prophet? He, the meaning of the prophet in Islam, his value uh, and representation as, uh, as a representative figure. But also about food restrictions, what are the connotations of religious prohibition in daily life in a culture where prohibition is just thrown upon. So I'd like to take the other vantage point now, which is from the vantage point of the secular. The historical meaning of caricatures, not only a demeaning tool, but also a cultural expression. Many Muslims don't have a clue about the historical value of caricatures in the history and the development of the secularization of Western societies. The meaning and scope of freedom of speech, not only an, as an excuse for insult, but also as a principle of democracy. The status of fiction or literature, not only as a pretext for conveying messages or hidden messages, but also a safe space for provocative imagination. And you can think about Salman Rushdie's, um, you know, uh, uh, events that uh, happened in the early 90s. So the translation, translation is the translation of key meanings of symbols of worldviews of common principles uh, like freedom equality human dignity for example and i refer you here to boaventura susa de santos who has um, a huge um, you know development about human rights as understood for example in the western in the Muslim and the Hindu uh, cultures uh, all together compared and translated in the way I, I, I'm, I'm um, proposing here. Translating bodies and gender relations and translating, you know, belonging, feelings of belonging is an important uh, translation as well. Translation as mutual integration of people imaginaries, ethos, and worldviews. This means for translation studies that they need to open up for social relevant objects to be translated besides language and culture. Taking the example of translation as mutual integration, it means to provide the effort of making clusters of miscomprehension accessible to other social groups. In this case, the objects of translation are not only the frames of reference, symbols, and knowledge, they are also people. People who, by being understood, will feel a sense of belonging. And my third question is how to translate these worldviews? At the light of the previous scenarios, translation is done based on a politics of recognition. You cannot translate by recognizing your equal fellow citizen counterpart. As a thick translation as well, with a space for cultural explanation, education, and learning, you have to allow for all group members to learn about the others, hence education on religions. This is something that is taken up more and more in post-secular countries uh, such as we can find some in the West. With, awareness, with an awareness of transformation and openness to self-transformation, a commitment to social change implies self-change. You cannot go into 
a translation process without committing to be open to transformation and change yourself. So through phenomenological experience of alterity, which means also meeting the other, you know, being having a real concrete relationship with the other is key, uh, usually to be able to go into this translational process, relying on an intimate, concrete lived experience of the other is no theory, this is concrete. By the competent knowledge and concerned position people, you know, a lot of time, and this is something that also Professor Shama knows very well in postcolonial studies, you don't speak for the others. You need to speak for yourself. Using reliable and primary sources, this means referring to those who are concerned with no intermediaries. From both sides, translation agents mediate the respective worldviews. It is important to note here that social translation needs to be bi-directional. And finally, the question is, okay, so translating, but who translates is a key question as well. At the epistemic level, Habermas attributes the role of translation to philosophy. For him, philosophy is the translational instance of semantic contents of religion into secular language because it ensures that the validity truth it will enunciate will not rely on any metaphysical or dogmatic truth. It means that it is accessible to the public. By virtue of his ability to salvage the universal moral contents from its religious origins, post-metaphysical philosophy becomes a key agent of translation. If some commentators consider theology as another mediator between the religious and the secular, it may be also the responsibility of Western Muslim scholars to translate their religion into the secular Western culture. But the greatest responsibility of translation falls upon both groups, you know, religious and secular themselves. For Habermas, translation must be a cooperative task whereby religious and secular citizens would learn from each other. In a multicultural context like Western democracies, translational agents need to be recognized, trained, and multiplied. Intellectuals and researchers uh, media and journalists, culture producers, policy, poli policy makers, sorry, etc. The goal here is to institute and promote a culture of full scale translation, which means considering the idiom of the worldview of the people producing discourse in the public sphere. So, just very quick illustration here. For example, in debate in the debates on religious science in Quebec, translating the concept of secular or laicite and that of state neutrality in the divide among Quebecers over the, the unsuccessful bills on the Quebec Charter of Values, for example, it proposed the ban of ostentatious religious symbols like the kippa, the cross, and the hijab. So uh, Two, there are two different worldviews there, uh, in the media at least, about the concept of secularism. You have secular in the meaning that it, the separation of religion from the state, which means the state does not tolerate the presence of any religious sign, which is a secular exclusionist uh, type of secularism. A second strand of secularism, you have it, the state must accept the presence of religious signs and treats them equally. Freedom of conscience, which is one of the basic uh, uh, values in, democ in democracy. And here you have a inclusionist type of uh, secularism. Uh, neutrality, you have the same kind of uh, divide. You have a more you know, neutral, neutral means that uh, you know uh, uh, you should not employ anyone 
who displays religious signs, which is a more radical type of neutrality. And then neutral means that you don't interfere in dictating the way religions express themselves, which means that the individuals are not to be confused or conflated with the state. A second case study I'd like to propose here is to show how sometimes uh, you know, around all the polemics around the, the, the prophet, there has been a lot of, uh, you know, manifestation and contests around, you know, the way sometimes the, the prophet was portrayed. So since 2006, whatever may be the intentions behind the phenomenon, Muslims were in fact the ones who were caricatured. <laughs> Uh, through the events we have encountered, a clash between protecting the freedom of expression and protecting the freedom of conscience and religions. So, uh, yeah, and uh, just to refer to Said, he talks about the clash of ignorance. I'd like to come quickly to the uh, example that I have. It comes from Sanad Collective. And here, for example, they promoted the um, uh, you know, an event where uh, Muslims would write love letters to the Prophet so that they can show and display, you know, their feeling of love to the Prophet. And this is very something that a secular mind would be able to kind of relate to by, um, you know, thinking about a love letter. If you write a love letter to someone, it means that you know, this someone is very important to you. So I'm going to move on here because, you know, um, to my conclusion, because I think I'm moving uh, uh, to towards the end of my uh, presentation. I wanted to show you uh, a video. Uh, it's three minutes, but I, I don't have the time. Uh, so just, you, you probably have seen it, but I'm, I'm going to stop there because I don't have the time to, uh, to show it. Sorry about that. So here we go. Translating social and political conflicts implies broadening the understanding of the notion of culture. Uh, in this sense, culture becomes a set of beliefs, an ethos, a world view and or a frame of reference that one could either share or be opposed to, although belonging to the same society, language, or history. So in terms of morality, people can speak the same language, but they may not understand each other, which entails translation as expounded in this paper. Okay, so translation doesn't need to be interlinguistic all the time, there are some horizons beyond. But more to our point, translating social and political conflicts starts from broadening the very understanding of translation itself. But in order to do that, we need to promote radical translatology that allows for the inclusion and study of other objects of translation than language and semiotic culture only. Thank you very much. That was it. Thank you, Professor Basalama, for this outstanding research and commitment to presentation time. Thank you. Now I invite Professor Abdurrahman Bikar from the University of Wilfrid Laurier in Canada. He will present a paper entitled Reinventing the Past Through Translation, the case of Alvar Nunez Capiza de Vaca's Relacion de los Naufragios y Comentarios, 1555. Professor Bicar is a professor at Wilfrid Laurier in Canada. He holds a PhD in Roman studies with a specialization in media discourse. He also graduated from the International Academy of Diplomacy and the Center of Diplomatic and Strategic Studies. Some of his works are translated into Arabic, English, and Spanish. He is currently working on a forthcoming book about the philosophy of translation and its various applications in the fields of humanities and social sciences. Uh, once again, I would like to remind the Sada al Mutabiyin that it is possible to listen to the Arabic language, to translate the Arabic language, by the way of the Kura al Ardiya and the Chinese or the Sinai. Professor Abdurrahman, the microphone is yours, please. Seven, uh, it's uh, 
age 17 here. So, uh, yeah, I would like to, uh, to, um, to, um, to say uh, thank you for inviting us and a special thank you to Professor uh, Sadiq uh, Johar for his patience and uh, all the help he provided through this, uh, this process. So um, I will start with the date, June 17th, 1529 is for sure an indelible and crucial date, not only for Albert Nunez Cabeza de Vaca, but also for a large portion of humanity, those affected by the arrival of Europeans at the shore of the Americas. This is the day when this man decided to join the expedition led by Panfilo de Narvaez under direct orders from Charles V, King of Spain. The 600 men, Spaniards, but also mercenaries and adventurers from other parts of Europe were expected to discover and, and conquer what is now known as Northern Mexico and Southern United States, Florida, New Mexico, Arizona, and California. The events surrounding this expedition are described by Albar Nunez Cabeza de Vaca, a treasurer who became the man in command after the tragic end of his companions. From this adventure, only four survived, the author, Andres Dorantes Carranza, Alonso del Castillo Maldonado, and the Moroccan slave named Estebanico, known in Morocco as Mule Mustafa Zamuri. Upon his return to Spain, Cabeza de Vaca was summoned by the king to write a relación, which is a travel report that the conquistadors were supposed to complete and present to the royal authority in which they were supposed to brief, to brief him about the mission. This relation is different from the rest of its general sense, known as naufragios or castaway. This account is more about a filler than a glory. Since the beginning, the operation was hunted by failure. It started with desertions, followed by the loss of two boats and their crew under the wrath of the Caribbean hurricanes. Still more than anything, poor judgment and stubbornness are, from the point of view of Cabeza de Vaca, the invisible hands that open the doors of misfortune. Pantifilio de Narvaez is described as the perfect illustration of poor leadership as a man who goes as he pleases. So Castaway tells the story of the tragic end of the expedition. The book is a depiction of daunting pictures with starvation, cannibalism. This is the only book where uh, white me. people are easy. Excuse, excuse me? me, professor. Yeah. Uh, can you just share the slide view, presentation uh, view? Uh, just uh, this is just the context. I will, I will, uh, I will share the. the thank you. Not all the yeah. I'm uh, just giving you. a context, a and after that you will. Uh, thank you very much. You're welcome. So um, this is this is the only book where you can see um, Europeans eating each other. It's white cannibalism. This is the only chronicle. Normally, it's the natives. Natives are described as as, uh, as cannibals, and so uh, and that's this book has a, a tone of a high high um, high geographic uh, writing, you know, the writings about the suffering by saints, and uh, Naufragio is also considered as the first colonial ethnographic work of its journey, since it contains meticulous depictions of the daily life, customs, languages of the native and their natural envi environment. There are two editions of Naufragios, or Castaway, named after the place where they were published. 
the Zamora one, 1542, and the Valladolid one, 1555. The Valladolid one is the one that I am using in this presentation. So the book has been uh, translated in more than one language, and sometimes you have in the same uh, version, version of the, the same translation has more than one edition, for example, especially in English, there are 17 editions of the translation of this book. In what follows, I will engage with English and French uh, versions of the book while looking for discrepancies between the translation and the original. I am interested in the way a translator is uh, reinventing historical events. And for this purpose, I will demonstrate how what is translated is not only the text itself, but a whole world vision and ideological stance, a set of beliefs and normative formations that determine the way described reality is shaped throughout the passage from a language to another. In this sense, the text is a pretext rather than an end in itself, a way to reproduce epistemological stances, categories, hierarchies, power relations that go beyond the author's own convictions. My work consists in exploring the way the original text is framed to fit in the new construction of reality, and then I will show how the framing works. The questions raised in this work are inspired by the debate initiated by the School of Decoloniality. Here he gives some names, Walter Mignolo, Arturo Escobar, Enrique Dussel, Aníbal Quijano, Nelson Maldonado Torres, Ramon Gosvogel, and others. So in a, in a nutshell, uh, decoloniality uh, believes that colonialism is not, is not, we're not done with, with colonialism. We're not in a post-colonial era. And uh, colonialism is still reproducing itself on epistemological grounds. In the limits of this paper, the focus is on how the translation, the translator is himself perpetuating colonial Eurocentric views to the point that she or he can be more colonialist than a conquistador from the 16th century. From the translation of Naufragios, it is obvious that a critical analysis of a work of translation must take into consideration the context. In other words, one must look at how this document is treated in such a way to fit the ideal reader's expectations according to an unwritten pact, a shared view of history. This view and the signs of contextualization it supposes are embedded in what can be considered as the fringes of the translated document, what Gérard Junet calls para and peritext. And the, the, the para and peritext is all that is not the text itself. The preface, the translator note, the footnotes, endorsements, the cover, etc. So these elements are pieces of a story that determine the rest. From these elements, we can underline a set of topics that determine the way the act of translation is undertaken. These are pieces of a large body an invisible frame where the final product is expected to fit. Naufragius is treated as a counter memory by these translators. Counter memory of the conquest. The translations included in this work share one point in common. The desire to give a different reading of this historical episode by capitalizing on the figure of Cabeza de Vaca as the apologist of the natives. He is also represented as 
the perfect illustration of the myth of the white Indian, the ones the one adopting their customs and ways of life, and also the revolutionary doctor centuries before Che Guevara, who comes to the Americas to cure his people from unbeatable uh, diseases and oppose their enslavement by Europe Europeans. So the, the alleged uh, moral exceptionalism that determined Naufragius is the main argument in a defense that goes beyond the limits imposed by the author himself and his companions um, in, the, in a way that the translator wants to help the author to give a better image of himself and of the expedition. To illustrate this idea, let us see how a scene from the book is translated, taking just less than one paragraph to, uh, to, uh, to talk about the, to this topic when it needs a whole volume. So this passage from the beginning, when the Spaniards were still enjoying power, is uh, telling the story of the encounter between members of the expedition and uh, the Timucans, a tribe from Florida. In Cabeza de Vaca's words, and um, I will uh, I will skip the the, the Spanish uh, text. So just in English, across we were greeted by about two hundred Indians. The governor went to meet them. After talking to them with signs, they told us to go back with them, and we decided to apprehend five or six. So now let us look closely to two points. A, the number of Tucumans, hasta 200 indios, around 200, and B, their attitude towards the, the Europeans. Nos señalaron de suerte que nos obvimos de revolver con ellos y prendimos cinco o seis. They told us to go back with them and we decided to apprehend five or six. Now let's look at the translation. From Henri, uh, Henri uh, Ternaud Compass, the, the French, uh, one of the, the French translation. Uh, and here I'm, uh, I'm skipping the, the French text. Once we reach the other side, around 1200 Indians walked up to us and the governor came to them and spoke in signs they asked us to follow them. Five of the six led us to their homes, half a league away. So you can see instead of 200, Cabeza de Vaca is talking about 200, more or less according to Cabeza de Vaca, the expedition is facing now around 1200 of them in a move that shows clearly how Ternu Compans wants to, engage, to exaggerate the danger faced by the foreigners who, by the same token, are innocent of any wrongdoing. The verb apprehending is now replaced by following. They asked us to follow them. Another translator, Fanny uh, Bondlier, gives the following translation. When we got across, they were to, they uh, they came towards us. Uh, some two hundred Indians, more or less. The governor went to meet them, and after he talked to them by signs, they acted in such a manner that we were obliged to set up on them and seize five or six. So one uh, can see how, from aggressors expressed by the act of apprehending. The Spaniards are now innocent victims, and at the same time, one can deduce that they are within their rights to defend themselves from a group of people acting with no reason. Martin Favata and Jose Fernandez add a layer of falsification. According to them, 
they indicated by signs in such a way that we had to fight with them. We captured five or six of them. And uh, another translator, Cyclone Covey, the same logic of reinventing roles is present. In the translation, they gestured so menacingly that we fell upon them and seized five or six. So not only 200 natives became 1,200, but also the roles and characters and characteristics are perverted. What is in the proper words of Cabeza de Vaca, an invitation to follow the natives to their homes, which can be interpreted as an act of hospitality, that they had enjoyed almost all of their stay, is now considered as an act of a pure and visceral violence. This detail shows the way a translator can behave like a colonizer in good faith, trying to absolve while, while tempering. So victimized, Porfirio Narvaez, the head of the expedition, is, history proves, a man known for his crimes. In torture and American tradition, this man is described by Brundage in the following terms. Using methods of intimidation mastered during earlier uh, campaigns in Cuba, Jamaica, and Mexico, Narvaez terrorized the Indians. And the author dresses a sadistic and maniac portrait of him. He described how, how without apparent reason, he gave orders to burn down the village of the Tocobagas, uh, which is a, a tribe from the region of Tampa in Florida, and how he turned attack dogs on its inhabitants. He then arrested the chief Iriwa and cut his nose after making him watch his own mother tore apart by hounds. So I'm jumping to the conclusion. By introducing changes in meaning, these translators propose a new reading of the original manuscript according to a given intellectual context. This can feed revisionist attitudes that consist in denying the crimes related to the settler colonial projects in the Americas. It can also be a translation of subconscious attitude embedded in the, archety the, the, archa uh, the archetypal uh, universe of the translator. Based on this assessment, it is obvious that engaging in decolonizing translation is one of the first steps in contesting epistemological hegemony. Thank you. Um, thank you, Professor, for the illuminating presentation. Thanks a lot. Uh, I just want to... Um, to say that the book, The Philosophy of Translation, is actually Dr. Salama's forthcoming book. I just wanted to make this correction. And uh, now with this, uh, with the presentation of Dr. Bekars, we end today's presentations and we move on now to take some questions. Uh, dear professors, if you would like to answer some of the questions and answers that you have received, please go ahead. Um, we have a question for Professor Basalama, uh, but it's not written actually. So we have another question for Professor Bekar. Do you believe that the translator is a traitor? If yes, please give us an example. If no, please justify your argument. Oh, of course, uh, well, the purpose of the lecture is, is to show how uh, the meaning is, uh, is sacrificed. And uh, you know, uh, this relation is these documents. I'm, I'm interested in, uh, in, in, in this uh, literature, not, not because, of, because of Cabeza de Vaca, no. It's, uh, I, I'm, I'm uh, writing uh, uh, something about uh, Estebanico, about Mulem Mustafa Zamuri and the construction of, of, of the figure of the, of the Muslim slave. And, um, I, I, it really, it is, um, uh, it is um, 
shocking to see translators and uh, colleagues uh, in the 20th century being uh, more vicious than a conquistador who went to the Americas in the 16th century. And uh, uh, changing, you know, the, the reality of it, what, what, what this conquistador is talking about, you know, when, when, it's, when uh, a person is talking about, to, about almost 200 natives and that almost the 200 natives become 1200, that's uh, the perfect example of, of, uh, of the translator as a traitor. Um, thank you, Professor uh, Bikar. We have another question for Professor Basalama. I yeah, don't know I read if you it. can see the question. Yeah, yeah I read it. Uh, have you considered the philosophical critique of Western secularism, where secularism is itself based on, is deeply imbued with Christian theology and, and language? This complicates the diet between Islamic and secular discourses that you seem to be drawing. Of course, and if you read uh, closely uh, Jürgen Habermas uh, on the question of uh, translation proviso, you will see that he is actually the very foundation of uh, post-metaphysical philosophy is the, at the end of his works, uh, more specifically, starting from the 2000s, he recognizes the religious origin of philosophy and of secularism as well. And, but the kind of narrow uh, uh, vision that he has is to limit Western secularization's origin or post-metaphysical uh, origin to uh, Judaic, the Judeo-Christian culture, as it is said usually. And everybody forgets, uh, Habermas included, that, that you know, uh, the uh, Islamic culture, uh, Islamic civilization was part of uh, the European, uh, uh, you know, uh, culture development and uh, the, um, the development of the Western civilization, uh, you know, uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the early uh, centuries of the, uh, the, uh, the second millennia. So, um, yeah, of course, I do recognize this, but if, uh, any type of uh, schematic uh, presentation of uh, this sort is, uh, is uh, usually very uh, reducing, just like the reduction of any complexity. And presentation in 20 minutes uh, <laughs> is, of course, a, a challenge to any type of, uh, uh, let's say, um, you know, sophisticated discourse. So, um, sorry to be very brief and reduce everything to the diet, as you say. I hope this answers your questions. Thank you, Professor. Hi, yes. Um, so I was talking to someone on the, I answered someone about Spanglish and somebody was asking about the multilingual imaginary. Um, I yeah, I do think that, yeah, I wasn't aware of this uh, concept, the multilingual imaginary, but thank you very much uh, for, for bringing it up. So it, a polygon film can encourage audiences to consider alternative modes of seeing the world. Yes, and I think that is part of my argument that if in the dub version, that is the French dub version or the Spanish dub version, we do not have this multilingualism, then the audiences from France or the French speaking or Spanish speaking will not be able to see that there are alternative modes of seeing the world and that in the States, people also speak different languages, not just English. And um, so, yes, I think, I, think I, I could actually use this concept of the multilingual imaginary to talk about this, this series. So thank you, Doris. Thank you. Uh, dear all, 
Now we come to the end of the second session and also to the end of the conference ad agenda for the first day. Once more, I thank all the speakers and conference followers, and I'm looking forward to seeing you tomorrow at 8 a.m. Abu Dhabi local time to resume the activities of the second day of our conference. السادة المشاركين والمتابعين شكرا لمتابعتكم ونتطلع لرؤيتكم غدا في تمام الساعة الثامنة صباحا بتوقيت أبو ظبي لمتابعة فعاليات اليوم الثاني للمؤتمر شكرا وإلى اللقاء